Well, I just want to welcome everyone again, um, those who are returning, welcome back. And for those who are maybe attending this a webinar for the first time, this is, um, as a reminder, uh, the second of two webinars jointly sponsored by CARA, uh, the Committee on Centers and Regional Associations, and the Digital Humanities. Uh, and hold on, Lisa. I mean, Laura, I'm going to get the whole title. Multimedia. Multimedia Studies yeah. Committee. <laughs> it's, it's right here. Thank you. Um, of the MAA. And we um, have partnered jointly together. I'm Ann Lester, Associate Professor of History at Johns Hopkins, and I've organized these webinars with Laura Moriale, who is the chair of the Digital Humanities and Multimedia Studies Committee uh, for the Academy today. And as I say, this is the second of two webinars. We've titled this one, Techniques and Tools for Teaching, Learning, and Researching Online, Manuscripts Mapping and Modeling. And um, I just want to say a few words about how, as I did before, how uh, this webinar will run. Um, like last time, we're devoting the first two presentations to presentations focused on and thinking about pedagogy, uh, the philosophy of teaching and learning, and online teaching and learning in particular. Um, so we'll hear from two presenters this uh, afternoon who are going to talk about issues related to that in a kind of broad way to, to get us to think about what it is and how it is we're, we're doing when we engage in online teaching um, and the kinds of um, tools that are available to do that. So that first part of the webinar will run until uh, about 3.15. We'll have time for questions and then we'll take a break from 3.15 to 3.30 as we did last time so people can um, get up, go offline, stretch their legs, do it, what we need to do, and then we'll come back back again at 3.30 and we'll hear three shorter presentations, what we've called tool talks, um, that are really focused on specific tools to um, help online learning in particular, uh, focused around medieval examples. There'll be time at the end of those three tool talks again for questions and then we'll wrap up around five o'clock. So just to give people a sense um, of how this will run. Uh, as with other MAA webinars, we've not enabled the chat function uh, for a bunch of reasons. However, the question and answer function is on and available and should be visible in the bottom um, bar register of, the, of your Zoom screen. So um, please, as you hear the presentations or towards the end, if you have questions related to what people have said, please um, pose questions. And myself and, and Lisa, as well as the other presenters, um, will watch and answer. Some may be answered online, um, some we will address in the question and answer period. Um, and I think as we go, when people make reference to um, certain things that exist uh, in links or through links. We've posted those in the past, particularly uh, Lisa has added those in as we've gone along uh, in previous webinars and, and we'll keep doing that. Um, that said, I do want to say that, that everything that's going to be presented today will also be recorded and will be available on the MAA website and through a link that will take you to the MAA's YouTube channel so you can watch the full webinar again. You can go sample pieces of the webinar if you would like. Um, there's also a link uh, through our site for these webinars to the Middle Ages for Educators site, which will also embed each of these tool talks and the other presentations in separate pages in that site. And as I said before, if you haven't visited the Middle Ages for Educators uh, website, it's really um, a wonderful, wonderful resource. It's been co-created uh, by Laura Moriale, Sarah McDougall, and Merle Eisenberg, and they've done a fantastic job bringing together Together, an incredible number of tools and resources for teaching in general, um, some specifically geared for online teaching, uh, but it's a, a wealth of material there and, and open for us. Um, so that's, I think, an overview of what it is we want to do today and how the webinar will run. Um, Laura, do you want to say a, a few words? <laughs> yeah, I just, I would just like to add um, uh, on the Middle Ages for Educators site, um, we just want to acknowledge that the site is being supported by the program uh, in Medieval Studies at Princeton University um, in the form of three early career scholars who've been doing a lot for us. Um, Abigail Sargent, Walter Beers, and Skylar Anderson. They've really been helping us with maintaining the site and looking towards um, some improvements that we're going to be making in the near future. So I wanted to thank them and to thank Princeton. Um, and then also to note that there will be a webinar um, that the AHA is sponsoring on Thursday, this Thursday, if anyone out there wants to kind of get a tour of the site and um, some other ideas about how to use um, the resources that are there, uh, particularly for digital teaching. So I invite you to join us um, at that too. Right. 
Thanks, Anne. Wonderful. Great. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Um, today, our first presenter is, is Andy Mink. And Andy is the Vice President for Education Programs at the National Center for the Humanities. He designs and leads professional development programs for K through 12 and university educators using hands-on instructional models and drawing on his experiences as executive director of Learn and See at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and as director of outreach and education for the Virginia Center for Digital History at the University of Virginia. Fundamental to Andy's work is the support of teacher leadership and curriculum design through OER uh, or Open Educational Resource Assets and Digital Technology. He currently serves on the Board of Directors of the National Council for History Education and the National Council for Social Studies, as well as as a member of the Organization of American Historians Distinguished Speaker Program. His presentation today is called Online in the Works, the MAA and Medieval Africa, showcasing and talking about the joint project that's been under underway uh, with the MAA geared towards online teaching. So yeah, Andy, thank you. Thanks, Anne, and uh, thanks, Lisa. Thanks to everyone for having me today. I really do appreciate the Medieval Academy of America for putting together this, uh, this two-part series. And as the first uh, presenter today, I also get to Thank all of our audience for being here. I know that we all have Zoom fatigue right now. We're constantly uh, in this virtual space interacting with each other. But um, you know, it seems to be the kind of thing that even in the summer months, we've all adapted to and adjusted. And in some ways, it's a really good, uh, really good setup for the coming, what's likely to be the coming academic year. Um, as Anne uh, mentioned, I'm from the National Humanities Center. I would encourage all of you to uh, visit any of the websites or the links that I'll be discussing today. Uh, you can find these uh, both on the screen, but we'll put them in the chat box or we'll make them available in, in other forms. Um, I'm coming, uh, joining you today from Chapel Hill, North Carolina. The National Humanities Center is located in Durham. And like most of your organizations, we've been closed for some time. Our physical building has not been occupied since about early March. We're scheduled to reopen open on August the 17th. And at that time, we'll welcome, officially welcome the 44th uh, cohort of fellows to the center. And each year um, by uh, reviewing applicants and choosing fellows across the humanities, we uh, really are intended to support humanities research, humanities scholarships. And as the only uh, independent nonprofit uh, humanities research center in the world, it, it's really the mission of the center, the primary mission to, uh, to advance the humanities through that scholarship. The education department though has what's increasingly uh, sort of a, a front part of this pivot and that is um, that we build bridges between that scholarly world, the world that many of us inhabit, with the world of the classroom. And we do so, and I use the metaphor of the bridge on purpose, because it's really intended to be a, a two-way collaborative uh, process. Um, it's not just uh, smart university folks coming to talk to teachers. Um, it's not teachers who are really versed in, and uh, confident in their classroom skills working with, with scholars. It's intended to be an innovative and collaborative space where scholarship can be infused in instruction and the best pedagogical approaches can uh, impact scholarship. Um, and it really, uh, it, it has increasingly been, I think on the minds of our fellows and the scholars we work with, likely many in our audience today that um, being able to work with and make comment on the world to be able to access that disciplinary expertise to the ever complicated world that we're living in uh, can really be reach its maximum potential in the classroom, whether that's face-to-face or virtual. Once this happens though, once we create these environments and these programs, some of which I'll share with you today, for scholars and educators to work through the process of applying the humanities to the world we live in, uh, we generate content, we generate um, resources, we generate uh, instructional materials, we generate scholarly materials. And like many of the organizations that you'll meet in this two-part series or likely work with in your own uh, professional environment, um, that content is now online, it's digital, it's accessible, it's, it's available in a very democratic way to those with uh, the access to the internet. Ultimately, I think what we're attempting to do, what we're hopefully doing is uh, really building advocacy for the humanities so that uh, in a classroom, K-12, collegiate, community college, informal, in a classroom setting, the humanities don't become secondary, they don't become a luxury, they don't become something that we do when the math standardized tests are completed and certain uh, requirements are met, but rather they are uh, ever important 
um, tools that uh, that are developing our citizens and developing um, our perspective of, of the world that we're living in. So today, what I'd like to do is focus that process, that process of connecting knowledge and content and scholarship with the classroom, really through two different lenses. And I'd like to share examples with you of ways that the National Humanities Center, in collaboration with the Medieval Academy of America and other partners, are attempting to do so on a, on a broad level. Um, I'm going to break this into two different perspectives. The first uh, I'll call digital learning, and that is you know, this notion that we are now all consumers of digital content. It's really remarkable to see this delightful cartoon from February 1959, that there could possibly be an electronic home library in which we would have access to knowledge and content and uh, data and answers of all the things, all the questions we ask and all the things that we wanna know. But in this asynchronous environment, I think one of the critical questions that we ask is who exactly is using this content? If we as a center, the National Humanities Center, either put scholarly materials, podcasts, a recording of this webinar, lectures, written documents that are now in digital form, if we put them online and we can gauge through Google Analytics who comes and accesses them or views them, if we can count the number of page views, and you know, I can feel pretty good when I report to my board that 4 million unique visitors come to our website, but who is that really? And what are they actually doing when they get this content? How is that content applied and how is it modified? In an education, I feel very confident in saying that very few, if any, educators take something they found online, an instructional resource, and apply it as is. They're constantly modifying and tweaking and changing and um, changing the pace and the sequence. Uh, it's important for us to think about the ways that this content or these puzzle pieces become curriculum become syllabi, become courses. It's important for us to think about ways that we can support this growing cohort of educators. Um, you know, within a few weeks, virtually every uh, uh, public school, independent school, university level classroom will have some form, if not an entire uh, presence on a virtual platform of some kind. How can we support those educators as they proceed with that process? At the center, we, have, we started doing that 20 years ago, as many of you did, by placing our resources online. Um, again, putting instructional materials, classroom-ready lessons, essays written by scholars was, a, was an early and important way for us to connect scholars with the audience, the audience of educators. A podcast series that allows um, scholars and educators to have discussion, to share their insights, to share their reflections. A webinar series, not unlike this one, where uh, educators visit and sp spend time asking questions of scholars to better understand the content. Uh, if nothing else, educators at all levels really do, a, they, they want to know things and they feel much more confident in their instruction where they can bring that scholarship to bear. But there's also the online teaching piece. So there's the digital learning, but there's the online teaching piece. And again, it's, uh, it, it's a little, uh, I feel a little smug even sharing a cartoon like this from 1960. It's closer than we think that a student would sit in front of a console and view a live instructor and take test questions or uh, make notes in an electronic uh, notebook while the hovercraft uh, homes in the driveway. Um, but as we think about asynchronous content, how can we create classroom environments, not just courses, but classroom environments in which uh, all the best practices of humanities education are brought to bear, things like discussion and debate, evidentiary argument, performance. Um, how can these things be built into a design that allows for educators to not just learn from scholars and scholars not just to model, uh, follow the, the lead model of educators, but how can they work together? And how can we build in formative and authentic assessments so that these courses become more than flipping through screens and answering multiple choice questions? Um, in the last two years, we have begun to build uh, many different online courses in what we call the Humanities in Class Online Course Portfolio. Um, I offer this first example because part of the title of today's session is mapping. And we have found that uh, GIS tools and a geospatial lens is really just a wonderful cross section that uh, moves through almost all humanities disciplines. But these courses are intended to be a blend of synchronous and asynchronous uh, learning. Uh, it's intended to be instructor-led for a cohort of educators at all levels who can really spend time with primary sources, with digital assets, with the process of thinking in these uh, fields 
to then create something and apply something that goes directly to their classroom. Uh, these online courses are built on our own learning management system. We do it in a WordPress, customized WordPress um, system so that we can monitor that community that I mentioned and we can uh, make quick and easy adjustments uh, as needed. And ultimately we can make them as interactive as possible. So currently we, as an example, we are collaborating with MAA to develop a course that will launch on September 14th of this fall, titled tentatively titled Medieval Africa and Africans. And we've really designed it around deconstructing the myths of ancient Africa. And there are many, um, certainly a non-expert or a public audience may even think of ancient Africa and medieval Africa in a sort of uh, abstract way. Um, and it's really interesting to talk to even the most experienced educators about what their perceptions of this topic is and realize the gaps in both resources and in training. We've structured this course around a series of myths or misperceptions and then offered expert guidance on how to interrogate that myth and how to develop the kind of responses that unteach the myth and emphasize and assess uh, the actual learning. So uh, topics like um, there is no medi medieval Africa or Africa was isolated, medieval Africa was uncultured or illiterate or insignificant. And ultimately what we're trying to do, I think, is have teachers realize that they can in fact teach ancient Africa and in many cases, they're not only required to by, by, by curriculum, but they can spend time on this as a way to really explore this topic with, uh, with uh, their students. We're currently developing this course. Uh, Kisha Tracy, who many of you probably know, is uh, really um, taking a lead on pulling in the appropriate resources, the lead scholars who are developing asynchronous content and media content for us. We're employing and engaging uh, digital resources from the African Studies Center at BU. And, and the audience of this course is intended to be agnostic, meaning anybody with an interest in this topic can take it. Likely, they will be educators at the K-12 level, at the collegiate level, they might be informal educators. And we do limit our courses to 40 so we can uh, create and support that community online. As an example, uh, about three weeks ago, I was doing a a week-long design training uh, session with teachers in Virginia, four different school districts, including the two largest Virginia Beach Public Schools and Fairfax County Public Schools. And in this entire uh, cohort of educators, uh, I worked with the third grade teachers. And the third grade teachers are required to teach ancient Mali and really have very little, as you can imagine, have very little background on or experience in teaching ancient Mali ancient Africa, medieval Africa. So being able to connect them with these resources and then invite them to think of ways to apply those most appropriately with their younger students is uh, part of the point of these courses. When the courses are completed or as they complete, we do then publish the teacher work, the teacher generated resources in the Humanities and Class Digital Library. This platform is an OER platform. Uh, many of you may have attended the first session of this two-part webinar series. And if you did, you heard from Alina uh, Zedko and Susan Ko about OER or Open Education Resources. And there are many, many reasons why OER is now a very important curricular um, necessity, really, of schools at all level. At the collegiate level, it's because textbooks are prohibitively exp expensive. At the K-12 level, it's because teachers are, are already looking for and finding digital assets. The difference is, as non-experts, they're going to Google and they're going to Pinterest and they're finding resources that seem to make sense for the curricular gaps that they're trying to meet. What OER does is create a platform and an environment where educators can find trusted and vetted materials, and maybe most importantly, they can not just access them, but they can also uh, publish their own uh, resources and they can modify existing resources. And it's that remixing piece that I'm particularly proud of with this, uh, with this project. And that is, again, uh, if as a user, you go to this free and open site and platform, you find a resource that is uh, appropriate, but it's ninth grade, and you want to change it to meet a 11th grade or second grade or college level, you can make that modification with direct citation to the original. So our online courses, as teachers produce content in these courses, it will be published in the digital library and then available for others to modify it, evaluate it, and make note of it. So that dissemination piece is uh, an important part of any digital landscape, I think. 
the Humanities and Collage Digital Library uh, currently uh, has all of the National Humanities Center resources as well as over 40 partner organizations uh, across the humanities. It's also a space where we're archiving both scholarly materials, things like podcasts and essays and uh, video recordings, as well as instructional materials, things like activities and PowerPoints and assessments. And taken together, what, these, uh, what this space allows, what this maker space allows is for an educator to come and find both simultaneously and then find ways to mix them together to publish something new and something appropriate for their classroom. Maybe as important as anything in an OER environment, a free and open uh, platform like this does invite a copyrighted either, uh, either and non-commercial and non-derivative. So many of our scholarly materials are non-commercial, non-derivative. We don't necessarily want other users to change an essay that Bill Jordan, a board of trustees at the center has written. But we also don't want folks to come in and scrape out the instructional resources and sell them in teacher pay teachers. So uh, we do use the, uh, the open Creative Commons copyright, but largely it's NC or ND um, in this free and open site. So with about five minutes left, I'm gonna take just a quick minute to show you this site and show you where the online course uh, both gets launched and where that work ultimately comes back to. And I should note again that uh, all of you are more than welcome to sign up for a free, what we call library card and explore this on your own. Thank you for being patient while we all navigate the Zoom transition. So the Humanities and Class Digital Library is really set up to support three different primary functions. Once you sign in and you receive this free library card, you will be able to uh, have your own profile and account that anything that you collect and curate is associated with. For example, if I click on my own profile, it allows me to show any resource that I've located that I've set aside for easy access and resource. So ultimately this is a site to get information and you can type in any number of keywords and in a simple search find, in this case, 107 uh, resources from many different organizations that have been involved around the word ancient. You can also narrow this down using the filter structure on the left and the metadata that's attached to it. This is like going to the, um, to the card catalog. You've typed in a word that you wanna find you locate a very particular resource that you're interested in. And by selecting that resource, it then allows you to see the metadata that's been attached. You can add keywords. You can add comments that go directly to the author. You can also save that resource to your private folder. You can connect it to your Google Classroom, which is incredibly important for K-12 educators. You can attach it to your own LMS or LTI. And then when you view the resource, it opens up in an iframe that finds this particular resource on our partner site. In addition to those individual resources, you can also discover materials by collection. And this is something that we're constantly uh, creating, these smaller curated sets of materials that focus on specific topics like voting and why it matters or teaching about race, place, and social justice. And this allows us to pull aside and create exhibits around the different materials that can be found. And you can find specific uh, links to partners, partners of across the humanities landscape who have all contributed resources, again, both scholarly and, um, and instructional. While you, can also, while you can consume information here, you can also publish. And that production element, I think, is another important part of the digital culture. It's not just getting things now, but it's also adding. And that adding includes either submitting from the web or creating an open author document, uh, basically a, a lesson uh, from this webinar that we're leading. Is there a way to create a lesson that we then post for publication? Um, once submitted, that uh, resource does come to our digital librarians at the center and we do approve it. So it sits as pending until it's approved and then it gets added to the same metadata that allows for discoverability. And then finally, there are groups uh, that are both user and content provider uh, created. These groups allow for a, a social component in the site. So not only can these groups be closed or open, meaning you can be invited or it can be just an open uh, discussion forum, uh, but each of these groups allows for um, the, the host to 
manage members, to use it as an LMS, to curate resources, uh, to communicate with members, uh, whoever they may be, and to lead discussions around different topics. So, so this, we, we are hoping as a makerspace is a, is a site in which uh, not only our online courses can spring from, but it also has a closed system then publishes material created in the online courses back in the digital library. So what I've shared with you today is what we hope uh, will be a pretty seamless experience for educators at all levels in which they are learning and collaborating. They're developing innovative curriculum. They're accessing the lead scholars and scholarship of all of our organizations. They're doing so in a highly interactive online environment. And then they have a makerspace afterwards to publish this material and continue to work in it. We're really pleased to be working with the Medieval Academy of America in, uh, in these projects. And I'm anxious to be able to share um, the outcomes after the course launches on September 14th. And I think that's 19 seconds for my uh, allotted uh, time. Thank you so much. Sorry, got to get back in my groove there. <laughs> uh, unmute myself. Thank you so much, Andy. That was that was excellent and um, incredibly useful. Uh, even though I've known about this project, I am always um, just staggered by the number of resources available uh, on the site and, and what it is you you guys are doing and continue to do. Um, extremely impressive. And I know that there are some um, questions uh, about this that are mounting. So thank you so much. Uh, great. Well, our next presenter is Dana Wessel Lightfoot, who is Associate Professor of History at the University of Northern British Columbia, Prince, Prince George, British Columbia in Canada. Her monograph, Women, Dowries and Agency, Marriage in 15th Century Valencia, was published by Manchester University Press in 2013. And she's an inaugural member of the College of New Scholars, Artists and Scientists of the Royal Society of Canada. And her current work is a collaborative project with Alexandra Gerson on Jewish women and conversants in late medieval Catalonia. And this project has been funded by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. And today she'll speak to us uh, about a teaching project she's designed um, entitled Following the Research Trail Online, Introducing Students to the Practices of Medieval History. Dana, thanks. Thank you very much, Anne. So let me just share my screen here. Okay, um, so I want to start by acknowledging um, that I am speaking to you today um, from the traditional and unceded territory of the Clayton Tene, which is part of the Dalketh First Nation. And I'd like to thank everyone for attending this webinar today. So today I'm going to talk to you about a scaffolded assignment that I use in my second year medieval history survey course. And I have an enrollment of anywhere between um, 40 and 60 students each year. And it's designed to introduce students to the practices of researching a defined topic related to medieval European history, using online and printed primary source collections, the international medieval bibliography, interlibrary loan, and the library um, catalog. And so the assignment has, um, I'm going to kind of give you a bit of an uh, overview of the structure and then I'll go into more detail. So the assignment has three different parts. Um, they start by finding primary sources. Uh, their second part is focused on secondary sources, um, first using the International Medieval Bibliography and Interlibrary Loan, um, and then evaluating a specific secondary source. And then the culmination of the project is to uh, write an eight to 10 page a research proposal. So today I want to talk about why I first developed this assignment, but also why I think it'll work really well for the upcoming semester when students may have limited or no access to a physical library. And then I want to explore some of the library resources needed and the specific stages of the assignment. And then finally talk a little bit about the supports I created um, to help my students succeed. And I'll note um, that all of the handouts for this assignment will be shared. Um, they're all available as Google Docs, so I'll put them uh, available. Uh, and people are free to use them as they wish. Um, and I'm also happy to talk to um, people in more depth about the assignment if they'd like to contact me. So let me talk a little bit about why. So I teach at a small remote university in Northern British Columbia. And as this image of two moose walking across campus shows, 
I also teach at a Canadian stereotype. Um, moose and bears are very frequent sightings on my campus. And we have a pretty small library that really can't support 40 to 60 research papers for a course on medieval European history. We just don't have the resources available. My colleagues that teach Canadian history, for example, can assign research papers because of the access to archival sources and other materials in our community. We have a number of archives, one on the campus and, and several in the community, but we just don't have that um, for medieval history here. So that was my one, my one concern. How am I gonna, what am I gonna get my students to do um, that involves research when I just don't have the library resources for them to, to do that? The second thing is that I wanted to provide my students with tools that they could use in my upper level medieval history courses in the future. So I was actually teaching this course in March when my university flipped online. And I was really grateful because my students um, did not need to have access to a physical library to complete their assignments. And I know for many of us, people were sort of juggling, what are my students going to do now that courses on our line and they can't um, get the books that they need. Um, for my students, that wasn't an issue. This assignment can be done entirely online using institutional library and open access sources. And for that reason, I think it'll work really well for the upcoming semesters. Um, and it also can be adapted to fit the needs of your particular course um, in a variety of different topics. So what kind of requirements do you need? So the first requirement for the way that I've constructed the assignment is that you need access to the International Medieval Bibliography, um, a database um, which indexes all kinds of articles and book chapters and other resources um, related to medieval studies. Now, many of your institutions probably already have this, but mine did not. Um, and so my acquisitions librarian actually um, contacted them and wrote, um, and they were able to secure a one-year um, trial for free, um, and then afterward negotiated an annual rate. Um, because it was a, is a required part of my course that I teach every other year, the library was pretty happy to pay for this. Um, and I've also used it and built it into some of my other courses. So it's been a really good resource to add to our library collection. The second thing that um, is required for the way I've constructed it is interlibrary loan um, services. So when I decided to put this assignment together, I contacted, we have one interlibrary loan librarian. So I contacted her and said, you know, I want to do this. I have 60 students. Um, I've asked the students to um, be required to order something through interlibrary loan. Are you going to be okay with um, fulfilling this number of requests? And she was thrilled. She was very excited. Um, and she worked with me um, to make it easy for students to request materials via the International Medieval Bibliography. So she made sure they added in a button so that students could just click on that and that would take them right to the interlibrary loan form that they could fill out to request materials. The other thing is open access primary source collections. So I used a variety of different ones. Um, these are just the ones that I found at the time. There are many others. Um, the Internet Medieval Sourcebook, um, Epistolae, um, Medieval Women's Letters, De Re, Re Militari has a number of, has quite a few and growing collection, um, Florilegium Urbanum and the Avalon Project. Um, I particularly looked for um, uh, translated primary sources um, that would work well for my students. So there are lots of other different things. I did use some printed primary source collections. And so when we could go to a physical library, um, I had them placed on reserve, but there are also growing numbers of eBooks. Um, and so my library was willing to buy those for me. Um, I also allowed the students to use our textbook. We used Reading the Middle Ages um, by Barbara, uh, edited by Barbara Rosenwein, and they could use that as one of their sources as well. Um, and again, you could just omit the printed source aspect and just use open access online sources. So what does the assignment itself look like? So first of all, I asked the students to sign up for assignments, and I did that um, just as a way, one, of providing them a bit of guidance, um, but also just to ensure that there was lots of different um, I, topics out there so they weren't all trying to do the same thing. I did give them a list of broad topics, so things like medicine or courtly love, black death, queenship, warfare that they could sign up with. 
Um, sometimes they, of course, everyone wanted to do the Black Death. Um, I suspect that would be the case even more now. Um, and if I had that was full, I, could, I would say, well, you could sign up for medicine and then look at medical aspects of the Black Death instead. And so I did meet individually with each student to probe their interests a little bit and help them narrow down their focus. Uh, and I think in the future, um, if I was teaching online with this, I would just set up a video conferencing um, appointment with them or a chat. Um, and this really helped me kind of guide them in a particular direction to make sure they weren't kind of going the wrong way. But a lot of them said it really helped them figure out what they were interested in about that topic. In part one, I asked them to find two primary sources using online and printed materials. And then I gave them um, a series of guided questions that were designed to help them analyze the text as sources for students of medieval history. And I didn't have them submit this as an essay. I asked them to submit it in a question and answer format. The next part of the assignment focused on secondary sources. In the first part, this is where they went and used the International Medieval Bibliography and I asked them to find three articles and book chapters. They were required to order at least one through interlibrary loan, but most of the students ordered at least two and often three. Um, because the International Medieval Bibliography indexes um, essay collections, it provided students with a wider variety of materials outside of other history databases. And most of the questions for this aspect of the assignment focused on having them parse different parts of the International Medieval Bibliography entry to understand indexing terms and to think about how these, um, how these topics um, were connected to what they were doing. In the second part, I asked them to choose one of the secondary sources that they had, um, had, had found and analyze it in more depth um, in a question and answer format. Um, and this was really designed to teach them how to analyze a secondary source. So they focused on um, sort of typical questions like thesis and use of evidence. Um, but I also asked them to do things like who is the author? Where are they from? What's their background? Um, to think about these contextual things when they're looking at a secondary source as well. And then the final component of this part of the assignment was to formulate a research question um, based on the work they had done so far. And I did give them some guidance here. Um, I gave them examples of what made a good research question and what made a bad research question um, and why the one was better than the other. Um, and then they would get feedback for that. So the culmination of this project um, was a eight to 10 page research proposal. Students had received feedback from the previous assignments that they had submitted. And I should note that I made sure that they had one assignment back before starting the next part because the assignments were constructed so that the feedback could help them with subsequent tasks. So for example, in part one, one of the things I asked them to um, write down was some of the topics that came out of the primary sources that they read, and then they could use those topics to search for secondary sources in part two. Um, and then in part two, when they talked about their research question, I would give them suggestions on ways to reshape their research question so that it was something that would be more uh, interesting and more attainable for them, um, perhaps than what they had written um, before. So the students took all of the information that they got from the other parts of the assignment, all of the feedback um, that I gave them, uh, and then they sat down with guidance um, to write their proposal. And so I, I gave them um, detailed information about what to include, how long each section should be, um, and the types of things that they were looking at. And I will say some of them said to me, um, they double checked, uh, am, I, am I allowed to use my stuff from my previous assignments? Because um, they were worried about plagiarism actually being, being getting into trouble for plagiarism. And I, and I said, no, that's the whole, that's the idea behind the assignment, right? I want you to use what you've done before. At this point for the final um, part, sometimes for some of the students, they got to the research proposal and they realized that 
the shape of their project had changed. And the primary sources they had originally chose for part one didn't really work. And so I did allow them to substitute um, sources um, if the course of their research had changed. Uh, and in some cases, I helped them find um, new sources that would fit better. Uh, and I did encourage them to go back and ask the same questions that they had done in part one and, and if they changed this uh, one in part two, just so that they had that information um, at hand when they, um, when they wrote their final part. And so I, cre um, I created really detailed handouts for each part, um, providing them with guidance on how to complete them. And again, I'm, going, I'm happy to share these and, and I'll make sure that people have access to them. Um, and uh, people are free to, to change them and use them as, as they would like. So let me talk a little bit um, about the supports I created. Um, these were done originally to um, help them complete the assignment and then they turned out to be very handy um, when we flipped online in, in March. So I started off by creating instructional um, short videos and even when um, I did this assignment in a face-to-face -face format, I created these um, short videos for each part, focusing on the various resources, um, the questions to think about, and how to choose relevant sources. Um, what, I, what I did actually was I picked a topic that was gonna be my topic. I picked medieval peasants. And then I walked them through as if I was one of them making decisions, looking at first at the International Medieval Bibliography for choosing a, a primary source, and then through the International Medieval Bi uh, Bibliography as to why I would choose one article over another as something that was relevant. And my students said this was really helpful because they weren't always sure why they why one would be better than the other. Um, so that was a good modeling. I also had um, our subject librarian come into my class and do a workshop with them on how to use the International Medieval Bibliography, as well as how to use interlibrary loan. Um, this could easily be done virtually through a synchronous a workshop or videos and, and those videos could replace the ones that I had originally created. To help them learn how to analyze an article in depth for part 2b, I did do an in-class group workshop where we all read the same short article, it was about four pages in length, um, that was related to a topic that we were covering at the time. And we analyzed it using questions from their assignment sheet. Um, and again, this could easily be transferred online through breakout groups or even a chat board or a discussion board. Uh, it took me a long time to find an article that I felt would work. I wanted something that was short, um, but also that had a clear thesis, um, easy to pick out primary and secondary sources, um, so they could really see what they were supposed to be looking for um, in their own projects. Um, and this was really helpful for the students um, later on. Now, overall, the student response to this has been incredibly pro um, positive. Um, they like the freedom to choose their own topic. Um, many of them commented that it helped them develop research projects in other courses, including outside of the humanities. Um, I, for some reason, my second year medieval course um, is uh, very popular among science students um, as their breadth requirement for humanities. Um, so I have a lot of um, science students that end up taking the class and many of them have commented to me that the assignment that they did for my medieval history course actually helped them write research proposals in their science classes um, for their science projects. So it was really great for me to see that these skills transferred across disciplines and weren't necessarily specific to history. As an instructor, um, it's really rewarding um, for me to do this because I teach many of these students in upper year courses. Um, my university is very small. We only have about 2,500 um, students overall. Um, so many of these students appear in lots of my other classes. So I knew if that if they had done this project, um, they did have the skills to complete upper year research projects well. Um, and I was very happy to see that they remembered <laughs> the skills, um, even though it had been a couple years that they, but they also said they kept the handouts um, and that allowed them to uh, uh, allowed them to uh, uh, to go back to them and to go over uh, the material if they needed them. Also, um, it introduces students to a field that I find fascinating and exciting. 
but it does so by giving them some agency to develop projects with supports in place um, to help them when they were needed. Um, and this for me was really important that I wanted the students to be the drivers behind this, but I wanted to make sure that they had what they needed in order to succeed. Um, so that's all that I have to say about that. I'm more than happy to answer questions and again to share um, any of the materials uh, related to this assignment. Great, thank you so much, Dana. That um, is really helpful and inspiring. I think especially for folks who um, are teaching in places where our libraries are, are completely shut down to us or else you know, don't have these kinds of copious resources. Um, so I'm going to start us out maybe with some of the questions that have come in. Um, and Lisa, hopefully you can uh, chime in as well. Um, for some reason, my question function is not showing me the new questions. I don't know why. So I'll have to tinker with that. <laughs> um, um, no problem. Do you want me to, uh, to read out the questions from the question box that have come in? Sure. Well, I, I could start with one that was just posed. And, and um, Andy, you mostly answered it um, online, but it might be useful for people to hear um, and think about and hear your fuller answer. But um, someone asked whether or not uh, they would be allowed or, or um, able to share the resources on the National Humanities Center uh, pages with their students and if their students could also log in and create accounts and, and can you talk to how that speak to how that would work? Certainly. Uh, you know, generally speaking, I would say that the work we do, including the Humanities and Class Digital Library, is intended to be teacher facing. But that doesn't mean that students can't participate or can't have uh, access. Um, I suspect that what what most educators will do is use it to find and curate materials, take them either into a virtual or a face-to-face -face environment, and then and then apply them somehow. Um, but I could certainly imagine uh, a time for students to be invited in as a class, uh, particularly if they were uh, collegiate level students, and a group set up so that the educator could then sort materials and curate them for those students to to view specifically. So. Uh, I mean, the short answer with anything virtual like this is, sure, why, why not? Um, although it's intended mostly to be teacher facing, which means the resources would have the same kinds of uh, access that teachers would need. Good. Yeah, Lisa, do you, do you see a um, I just can't go back to the recently posed questions for some reason. So I'm going to let you take over. <laughs> No problem at all, Anne. So we have a few questions for Dana. So the first one is um, someone asking about sharing the resources. And, and yes, I'll say for everyone, all uh, panelists, resources, bibliographies, links will all be available uh, on the Medieval Academy website and also on Medieval, um, uh, uh, Medieval, what is it again? Middle, Age, Middle Ages Middle for Educators. Middle Ages for Educators, sorry. <laughs> Not medieval, Middle Ages. It's a noun, not an adjective. Exactly. <laughs> so that will be uh, that will be happening uh, in the coming days. Um, Dana, someone, we've got a few questions for you. Um, one is, uh, what level of course, uh, what level of students uh, are is this assignment appropriate for, and how do you define a research proposal? Um, those are the first two, and then there's uh, there are a few more for you as well. But go ahead. So my class is a second year course, um, and uh, I introduced it in that class because my colleagues who teach in Canadian history do do research papers in the second year level. Um, so that's the, the level um, of it. Um, it. When I'm talking about a research proposal, I'm thinking about a proposal that one would put together um, for a longer research essay um, or um, a thesis. Um, so. The proposal itself involves them posing their research um, question and then um, discussing um, the topic more broadly that they want to look at. Um, then the first part, they talk about their uh, primary sources. So they talk a little bit about context and um, uh, the material and then how they think their, um, pr their primary sources will help them answer their research question. Um, in the next part, they explore their three secondary sources and again, think about argument and evidence, but also focus on how um, this would help them answer their research question. And then the last part is they sort of map out 
if they were going to write an essay, what do they think their essay would look like? So they, they propose a potential thesis um, or argument and then talk a little bit about what the structure would look like overall. So that's what I mean by a research proposal. And the, all of that's laid out in the handout that they get um, to write the final part. And did you give any um, guidelines specifically for choosing their primary sources, how long they should be, whether they have to be complete sources or could be fragmentary? What kind of guidelines did you provide for that? Yeah, so I give them at the, at the, at the beginning of the part one um, assignment, I gave them guidelines on length. Um, so I asked that they be a minimum of um, 400 words. Um, and um, that they look at the type of source that they're, they're looking for. And I gave them some guidance around um, why one source might be better rather than, than another source um, so that they could know what they were looking for. Because um, the Internet Medieval Bibliography has lots of great sources, but some of them are old, the translations are older or hard to understand or, and so I, I kind of try to, um, in the handout, show them why some might be bet more useful than others. So I did give them a lot of guidance in choosing sources. That's really important. There are so many sources out there that it is important to provide some guidelines about what's, what's appropriate and what's going to be uh, fruitful, right, in their, yeah. in their investigations. And when they, hit, when they submitted their assignments, if when I, I, saw their, I saw their sources and I thought, well, not, I don't think that's really going to work, I did actually give them the opportunity to redo the assignment mm -hmm. um, if they wanted to. If, if, they, if I thought, you know, this is really not going to work for you, um, then they could have the opportunity to resubmit. And that actually leads into the last question. Uh, well, it's two questions that are sort of together, which is uh, someone is, would like to know how you weighted the different parts of the assignment in your assessment plan. And then finally, if you got any uh, resistance or pushback from students about this assignment, and if so, how did you handle that? So I made each part worth, except for the, the proposal, worth very little. Um, so the first part was worth 10%. Um, the part 2A was only worth, um, was worth 10% and then part 2B was worth 15 and then the proposal itself was worth, um, I think 20 or 25, I'd have to look at the, at the, but I figured by that point in time, they had so much feedback that I actually wanted to reward them, um, for, for working hard on that. So, um, I did, I did try and scaffold it and make things worth, worth a little bit. Um, I actually have not had any negative um, responses, at least given to me, <laughs> that they've well, said to me. I hope not. It's a fantastic <laughs> <document>. <laughs> um, They all really liked it. They liked the fact that um, it kind of taught them. And a lot of them commented later on that because they had used interlibrary loan in their second year, that when it came to their fourth year, when they had to do these really big projects, it wasn't so scary. Um, and our interlibrary loan librarian is super nice and um, was was more than willing to help the students um, and, and to guide them, right? Like sometimes they would order something and she would be like, oh, what's going on here? And so she would email them and say, are you sure this is what you want? <laughs> Just to make sure. Um, so overall, they really liked it. Um, and a lot of them so actually, um, I've had three of them that the topic that they did for this project they ended up using for their um, undergraduate honors thesis. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. Wow, yeah. that's that's great. Um, that's a great um, judgment on the assignment, right? I mean, yeah. clearly it, uh, it really kindled something in them. That's, that's fantastic. Uh, that's all the questions that have come in from attendees. I don't know if you want to take the mic back and-, uh, and sure. go from there. sure, I mean, um, I, don't, I don't know if presenters have some questions I have two I would pose to you guys, but maybe I'll open it up to others if there are thoughts, comments, reactions we could share. Try to have a conversation. <laughs> um, actually, I, I have a question, um, Dana, for you. Um, could you tell us more about the Q&A aspect of the assignment and how that, how that worked and what your students' experience uh, of it was? Yeah, so, so um, initially I thought I'll just have them write these like little essays um, in response to the, but then I thought, um, I wonder if having, do, breaking it down into a question and answer format would help them kind of focus less on the mechanics of writing an essay and more on actually answering the specific question that I was asking for. And when I asked them the question, I did actually say, you know, um, uh, two paragraphs for this. So I did give them say, this is what I'm looking for. This is how much you should be writing about for this particular section. Uh, and the questions, I tried to make them as specific as possible um, so that 
um, the students could really know what I was looking for. Um, so when I said, you know, what is the author's thesis statement, I gave them some guidance on like, this is what a thesis statement would probably look like. Um, and that's why too, when we modeled the, um, the analysis of a single source in class was really helpful. And for the primary sources, we had been doing that all semester anyway, so they already had those skills. But for me, the question and answer format was really useful and just really getting them to be specific and look at individual things um, rather than trying to worry about, you know, do I need a thesis statement or how, what's my introduction going to look like? Or, like they didn't have to worry about any of that stuff. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, I know, Jan, I'm always surprised by how um, respectful students often are of interlibrary loan. They don't want to bother the librarian, so they you know, be like, that's what they're there for. Um, so that, I, think, I think that's wonderful to kind of force them to go and engage in that, in that way and uh, open that up. Um, um, uh, and we have had one, one other question come in. Yeah, go for it. And then I'll pass my question to Andy. <laughs> okay, and one last question for Dana. How do you handle the issue of materiality? Are they only studying the text itself or do they also uh, somehow engage with the material object of the manuscript or some other, uh, some other way that the, um, that the source is being transmitted? For now, um, I did it ba textually based. Um, I would really like to, um, and some of my students did ask me um, if they could use, um, uh, some of them, some of them uh, were really enthusiastic and went hunting on their own and found these great manuscripts. Um, and I, I sort of, I said, I had one really good student that I did allow to do that and I kind of gave her some um, framework to, to use that. But I think that's something that I might think about in the, in the future. Um, and maybe if I use a similar assignment in a more upper level class, because um, I think that would be really great for them, right? To, to have them, because there's, again, there's a growing number of these online manuscript um, collections. And I think it would be so useful and exciting for them, right? To, uh, to be able to go and engage with those. So I think that's something that I would think about in the future. Um, I didn't, I don't do it right in the way it's structured right now, but I think it would work really well too. Yeah, it would also be an interesting opportunity to consider the difference between, a, you know, a, a text that has dozens of manuscripts that survive and a text that only survives in one manuscript, right? I mean, it allows you to ask some really interesting questions about transmission and popularity and why, you know, why some uh, manus why some texts don't survive in as many copies. Of I mean, and part of what I want to do is get them excited about the Middle Ages, right? And so I think that type of thing would be really fun for them to think about. Yeah. Uh, all right, go ahead, Anne. Well, yeah, so I, I wanted to ask Andy to, to go back and kind of ask us to think a little bit more uh, on, a, on a meta level about what we're doing, what we're asking our students to do, I guess, picking up on those uh, amazing cartoons, which I think about my parents having seen uh, when they came out. I'm wondering what your thoughts are about the longer impact of online learning in, in the in the way that we're turning to this very intensively and obviously I think we're all trying to do our best if we're here we're listening to this webinar our best to think about how to teach and how to use these resources in an engaged and responsible way um, but I, I wonder sort of what you're thinking or other educators that you've worked with particularly in the K through 12 range um, you know what their excitement is but also what their concerns are I mean I'm trying to think a lot about as I transition online um, to what it is I'm missing and how to not necessarily replicate, right? That's not possible and maybe we don't always want to do that, um, but how to um, think about some of the key dynamics that I am going to miss and, and what are ways that I can um, pull some of those ideas or ambitions or sparks back into an interaction like this. Um, so I'd just be curious to hear what you think. Thanks for the question and you know the, the answer I'm going to get is is optimistic and I'll 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 share in particular what I consider to be a lot of opportunity that's coming, but I have to start by saying the world is an absolutely sideways place right now, and it's disruptive on all levels and all layers of our society and education in particular is, you know, is just a, a, a catalyst for these kinds of anxieties and these kinds of concerns. So, you know, anything that, that we're about to say on this, um, on this webinar, the things that we might talk about, there is a very practical and real uh, implementation of of any of the of any of these possibilities, um, but to give you a little bit of a of a context, um, each summer 
uh, I host a graduate student summer residency. And until this year, it's always been a face-to-face -face residency, which we bring PhD students uh, from, I think uh, last year we had maybe 30 different universities from disciplines across the humanities who come to the center for 10 days and they specifically are there to talk about and think about uh, teaching and learning in their careers, wherever that may take them. This year, we, of course, we pivoted to an online and a virtual residency, um, and I just completed it last Friday. So I had 80 PhD students stretching from the West Coast to the East Coast, all kinds of universities, um, all kinds of disciplines. They were from their second to their seventh year. A few literally got postdocs as they were in our, inst our residency. And many of the kinds of concerns that they raised are the ones that you might imagine. Um, how do I master the technology? How do, how, how do we aim to replicate, but acknowledge then that we can't replicate, so what's, what's the replacement? And I think what we tried to really encourage for them was that this in some ways is a, is a wonderful opportunity to rethink teaching generally speaking, to move it from a lecture-based uh, environment where I, you know, I come into a Zoom conversation and I talk to you or I record a video and I talk at you to a much more collaborative space where uh, you flip the classroom in a much more intentional way by creating asynchronous material that students review and then meet synchronously for discussion or group projects where students from literally across the country in different time zones can collaborate and produce something together and what tools and platforms are available for that. So in, that, in the residency, we actually tried to model it in the program, but also introduce them to all these tools. But the, the subversive message, and maybe my answer to your question is, things are so sideways now. You can sort of get away with being really creative and innovative. And in, there, there's almost a permission, sort of a tragic permission of, we're all just trying to make this work so that if you have the, um, the impulse and you have the support to, to really rethink how a grad student or a TA or a young faculty or, or a senior faculty or a K-12 teacher, how you even approach your discipline, this is the time to do it because you get a lot of leeway. <laughs> There's a lot of wiggle room. Um, on the other hand, just briefly and quickly, I'll say that some of the challenges and some of the changes that come with that opportunity that I experienced last week had mostly to do with ac accessibility, meaning they had constant access to me. And unlike a face-to-face -face environment where the bell rings and kids leave or the day's over, between Slack and chat and text and email, you know, there's, there is a sort of hyper uh, attent attentiveness to an online format that you either have to put a boundary around or you have to accept and say, you know what, for five days, you can text me 24 hours a day and just roll with it. So, it, you know, it does come with some pros and cons, but I I largely think that this will be a pretty remarkable semester for education at all levels because there's opportunity to do some great things. And of course, I'm not talking about all the horrible realities of what I just said. So anyway. Anne, can I um, ask an audience question? Yeah, yeah, please. So, uh, Bill Enders uh, asks, <laughs> I suspect the answer is no, but we should be. Is anyone using 3D or RTI renderings of manuscripts to provide students with a better sense of the materiality of manuscripts? I don't know if anyone uh, on this panel has, been, has done that. Um, I can say that Bill's work is really, really cool. The St. Chad Gospels comes to life. And, and in fact, I'm going to post in the chat uh, for everyone a link to um, some of Bill's work on the Chad Gospels. But if anyone has done that, um, please feel free to chime in. There's, you may not even know this work is being done. It's, it's pretty cool stuff. Yeah, Pamela. Um, I haven't done that, but I, it reminded me that one thing that we often forget we can be doing is talking with libraries when they do have collections we can use. Um, my, my spouse is a rare book person and he's spending his summer setting up a, a sort of eye in the sky camera so that even if students can't come to the library, they can look at books in real time with a camera above, perhaps with the instructor in the room, so that people will get a sense of the, of the material quality of those books. So I, I think it's, um, there are many ways to get at that that we ought to be thinking about. Yeah, Laura. 
Yeah, and I think also uh, the Schoenberg um, at UPenn has a, a series of introductions to medieval manuscripts um, that people can, mm -hmm. can take a look at. Um, there are so many that you can't keep track of how many there are. So that is just another resource if people want to have their students um, engage with, with manuscripts. That's, that's also um, an option. I'll, I'll put a link to that in the, um, there's a, there's a one link that collects all of the uh, manuscript introductions they've done and I'll, I'll put that in the chat too. We have a few more minutes, so I'm going to circle back around with another sort of larger <laughs> comment and question. Um, one is a little sidebar relating to the materiality in these manuscripts. There are a lot of articles written within the history within the literature on materiality that um, are really wonderful about provoking both students and readers to kind of go out into their worlds and their environments, right, and pick up stones or wood or what have you and think with the materials. And I think in the spirit of what Andy was talking about in terms of risk taking and doing something new that we wouldn't do normally in our kind of lecture driven uh, classrooms, that that is a really um, a, a nice call to get people to go out into their own world, step away from the computer, right, and interact with things that, um, you know, even even just thinking about an older book you might have on yourself uh, as an analogy, you know, analogy or analogous to manuscripts. Um, I think that's a, a, a really important and inspiring idea to think about, which is how can we take this moment to to teach differently, right, and to find props around us in a way that we wouldn't normally be able to have or take advantage of in our in our lecture halls or campuses. Um, and I guess going back to this question about the kind of broader effects of um, this pivot that we're all doing into to thinking and interacting online, in the webinar, the previous webinar, just as we were sort of wrapping up, one of the participants kind of made a, a comment and question at the same time, which is to say, it was a sort of caution that um, it's important for all of us uh, to think about the incredible amount of labor and time that goes into this. Um, it goes into creating these digital resources, of course, that goes into restructuring our classes as we pivot online. Um, but that also goes into the exactly what you were talking about, Andy, the dynamic of kind of being available all the time, right? Not being able to close the office door. And um, I wonder, and I think we within CARA and the MAA may think about um, a way to respond to that and, and kind of statement that we could put out. And this has come up in other contexts before. Um, but if there are things that uh, some of the other participants have encountered or, or thought about or talked about with respect to um, both the labor of instructors, but also TA labor, um, the labor behind the scenes, right? And that we need to um, be aware of our own you know, humane limitations and, and where we can and cannot be, um, but also what we're asking others to do, be it TAs or indeed our students, because I think, and I want to put this out as a sort of caution, we put this together to offer access to all these different tools. We don't want to communicate the message that everyone should use all of these tools all at one time or ask our students to learn all this vast panoply of resources. That's that's not the goal here. Um, and, it, you know, I think we all need to to keep in mind um, that, that everyone's learning all of this at the same time, which is wonderful, but also um, uh, we're limited by, by our own resources and time. I don't know if others, that, that wasn't quite a question, but I don't know if others have thoughts they wanna add to that idea. I'm, this is something I'm thinking about a lot because in the fall I'm teaching the first year um, pre-modern world history survey. Um, and so I have two TAs. Um, but I also think a lot about what my students, and so I, I, I did use, um, you can find these online um, workload estimators for students. Um, Rice University has one, there's a few others. I can put some in the, in the chat. And they were really helpful for me sitting down and thinking about the kind of different components of how I'm planning my class and what that means in terms of the amount of work for students every week. So the first time I did it, it was like, a crazy amount of work and I was like okay I need to <laughs> I need to rethink what I'm doing but then also for my TAs um, our TAs are unionized and so um, they have a particular amount of hours within their contract and I I, I mean I, I've always sat down and figured out to the minute what their contracts are but this time I've tried to be mindful and build in um, 
time for them to learn to use the resources that that I'm using. Um, just like using, you know, I mean, they've, they've used Blackboard before, but I'm actually not using Blackboard for teaching my course. I'm using another, another system instead. Um, and uh, so I need time to train them. So I've made sure to build that in because um, I think it's, um, and then I can just take on some of the other grading myself, right? But I, I just, I think it's really important that we are really mindful of the fact that regardless of whether or not our, our TAs are unionized, um, that, that um, we don't want to overload them, right? I mean, we, <laughs> we, we need to be mindful of the fact that, that they have lots of things that are balancing too. Um, so these are the questions I've really spent a lot of time thinking about in the last couple of weeks. So Andy Mink has very helpfully posted a link to the National Humanities Center workload estimator um, to help you answer some of these questions. So that's posted in the chat. Uh, we have two more questions from the audience. So one is, uh, Anne, you're being asked if you could offer some examples of articles on materiality that you mentioned, maybe um, just throw them into the chat or email them to me and we'll post them on the website. Uh, and then Chris Baswell asks if uh, we could hear a little bit more about the eye in the sky camera for remote manuscript viewing. I could very briefly answer that if you'd like, right? Yes, please. Um, we experimented actually in my house because I had a library trip planned for the class I was teaching. Um, you know, obviously no way we were going to the library to look at rare books, but my husband's the rare book librarian at Firestone. So he said, well, why don't we just do a demo here and we we hooked up this cell phone on a ruler on a step stool over the books we had you know random random books at home that were not the quality you would have seen in the library but it was at least a physical thing and um it worked pr pretty well you know he sort of turned the pages and talked and i talked to the students and um he brought that idea back to the department and where they had already been sort of thinking about ways to to bring the books to people and I think they're setting up a tripod and an overhead camera that will simply allow, you know, that sort of zooming in, but with much better technology. And, you know, it's, it's, it's very important because you see scale, you see stiffness of pages, you see um, the materials involved, you get a much better sense of how humans interact with the book. And because that's what books are made for, it's much, much, it's much more important for the students to know that, you know, it's a, you, looking at them, say in the index, you know, my index of medieval art or, or in Schoenberg is good, but the video that the Schoenberg offers or the, the human viewing is, is I think much more effective. Laura, yeah. Yeah, can I just add something, uh, an experience that I've had um, with both using both the digital and the material, since we're now in a sort of world where we, we often start off with digital. Um, a project that I did involved um, looking very closely at um, uh, an, a, a, an early printed book and we spent about half of the semester looking just at the book very carefully, learning about it in its digital format. And then we were allowed to go to the special collections and look at this book. And I have to tell you that um, because the students knew the book so well already, it was like meeting someone that you only knew on Twitter, right? <laughs> like you knew this person, but all of a sudden, like everything about this, the materiality of this book just came to life. So, you know, I, I, um, while we all sort of want to, um, Think about how the material the materiality is is a sort of better i think that the digital and the material can work together and you know maybe if we all get back um, in the springtime or something like that we can think about what we learned in the digital and how we can pair that with the material yeah, very nice. yeah. so i wanted to mention a couple of things um, in terms of this digital and material um uneasy marriage one for someone who was asking about uh, this material approach to manuscripts and other objects. Um, various museums have partnered with um, with a program with a with a uh, platform called, called Sketchfab, and Sketchfab allows you. So, uh, Cleveland Museum of Art, my museum, uh, partnered with them. So, if you simply Google Sketchfab, uh, Cleveland Museum of Art, you will see that they have three D scanned a variety of objects. And they 
you know, there's a video that pulls them apart and puts them back together, but you can also rotate them. So the weight cup, the famous weight cup of the animated script is there. So um, you can, you know, pick up your cup and you can look inside and you can look on the outside and you can rotate it, which is extraordinarily important now that um, so many, our galleries are closed, right? And we don't know for how long. Um, and I completely forgot what else I was going to say. There was a second part to this. I'm sure it will come back to me. We get to hear more from you, so <laughs> you can hold on to that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Lisa, is there one more question or have we maybe resolved that? I think, uh, oh, no, wait, there is one more. I keep muting myself. There we go. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, some Laura Smaller asked if we could include a link to the Mu Cleveland Museum of Art. And actually, I was just rummaging around the internet looking for it. But Alina, oh, if, you could have it, if you could put that in the chat, that would be great. Thank well, you. I, I will add some references in the chat as well to um, some of the articles I had in mind. But we are now at 315, which is the time we had set aside um, for a bit of a break. <laughs> so people can uh, get up, stretch their legs, turn their screen off for a minute, take a breather. Um, and then we will come back uh, at 330, uh, 3.30, and we'll hear the three tool talks uh, that are the second part of today's webinar. And at the end, there'll be time for questions again as well. Um, so let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to reboot my Zoom so I can get the question capacity back, just so people know. <laughs> uh, but I will see you all uh, at 3.30. Thank you very much to our first presenters, Andy and Dana. We're incredibly grateful for this. Thank you so much. Well, welcome back. And I think I have my, yes. Uh, questions are up and going because uh, Elena, you were just talking and maybe maybe uh, we'll come back. There was a question about um, the resources from the Cleveland Museum, but I have a hunch you're gonna talk more about that. So um, you, can, you can tell us or possibly link uh, uh, to that uh, as we go forward. Um, great. Well, welcome everyone uh, back to the second half of the webinar, um, which is going to be dedicated to our three tool talks. And I'll introduce each of the presenters and then again, we'll have time for questions at the end. Um, so we're going to start today uh, with our first presenter, Sean Hill, who is Fordham University's instructional technologist for digital scholarship and pedagogy. And there he works with faculty across Fordham's many schools and departments to encourage the use of innovative digital technology in the classroom. In doing so, Sean helps faculty offer students new and creative approaches to existing course assignments. He has worked uh, in Fordham classrooms, he teaches new technologies to the students, serves as their support backstop uh, so for faculty so that faculty can focus on assessing student writing, creativity, and critical thinking, um, and supporting their technology. Sean brings the expertise of 34 years of teaching in seven countries between North America, Europe, and Asia, combined with a background in visual arts, geography, ESL, and technology. And today he's talking to us about reading together, using perusal to gloss the online text. And he's um, used in his presentation today, I just want to credit uh, everyone here, instructional materials um, that were put together by Caroline Smith, who had used this program previously. She's an independent scholar, but also teaches an affiliation with Fordham University as well, and is the author of Crusading in the Age of Joinville, and the translator and editor of Joinville and Villehardouin's texts, which many of us use in the Penguin edition, Chronicles of the Crusades. Um, so when all this material is also linked to the Middle Ages for Educators, um, that, that is also material that Caroline Smith has provided as well that Sean's going to walk us through now. So please, Sean. Great. Well, well thank you so much for that. I'm going to uh, now share my screen here. So um, as mentioned, I have, uh, I, I work at Fordham University here in, in New York City, and I have an amazing job. Um, I just love it. And it is essentially helping the faculty find new and innovative ways to present material um, and to approach their subjects, um, just not only to stimulate and encourage students to participate, but also to refresh and rejuvenate the, the instructors as well. And a tool that we've been using at Fordham for the last couple of years, which has proven enormously successful, is a Perusal. And Perusal is a social annotation tool. It comes out of Harvard University. 
Um, you may know Eric Mazur, who was the lead developer of this particular application. It is made available free to our institution and can be made available free to your institution as well. Um, it plugs into your learning management system. So if you have Canvas or Blackboard or Moodle or any other system, Perusa plugs into that learning management system. If after this webinar, you go to your IT department and they say, no way I can get that done by September, uh, don't worry. You can still create your own perusal.com account. Once you've done that, you create a class and then you invite your students uh, that are taking your course, for example, in the fall to join that. So you can do it purely on the perusal.com environment. Um, and Perusal is, as I said earlier, a social annotation tool. By that, I mean that class readings that you would have assigned anyway suddenly exist in one digital form. And all of your students annotate that common text and not only comment their own thoughts and ideas about the, the writer and, uh, as, as Dana had mentioned, the thesis that is being presented there, but also they comment on each other's comments. They ask questions about meaning and understanding. They answer each other's questions and hopefully they engage in a back and forth and, and even respectfully disagree if that's, if that's the case as well. So it's a fantastic tool. Essentially, it deals with your class readings. And Perusal is actually uh, particularly well situated to address a number of the COVID-19 challenges that we are all thinking about it and, and I think, you know, had been mentioned, Adam had mentioned earlier on, which is, you know, if we are going to teach and we want to have an asynchronous tool like Perusal, how do we find and, and employ this so that it is both thoughtful and rigorous in the classroom? How do we help our students understand and gain skills in close reading of material that we present to them, primary and secondary, of course? And the third item here I think is super important, which is how do we promote a, an intellectually supportive community? And when you think about the atomized world that we're about to, to face in the fall and, and perhaps in the spring and beyond, how do we bring together a student that may be in a different time zone, one that's living in a dorm room, a commuter student, um, person who uh, is just unable to get to campuses. How do we bring these students together and create a community? And, and I think Perusal does a great job of that. And lastly, how do we make sure that when we are going to have synchronous aspects to our class, so uh, a webinar or a physical in-person class or some kind of combination of the two, how do we make sure that those um, those sessions are as rich and as fulfilling as possible. And ultimately what we're trying to do is make sure that those classes don't begin with the dreaded, you know, any questions about the reading. Because with perusal, you are able to actually know what the questions are before you enter that synchronous um, aspect of your, of your course. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm actually going to leave the uh, slideshow such as it is right now and go to Perusal to show you what it actually looks like. So I have logged into our Blackboard system here at Fordham, but as I said, you could log into Canvas or Moodle or any other learning management system or just go directly to it. And this is the instructor view of this tool. You'll notice there's a getting started uh, section here that I would recommend you take a look at the welcome message that they have for your students that explains the why are students using Perusal. There's a library where you upload your course readings, the class readings that you would like your students to engage with. There's an assignments tab and a students tab. Note under students, you are able to group your students into smaller groups if you have a particularly large class. I noted Dana had been mentioning that her class uh, could go up to 60 students. That would be a little bit crazy, I think, to have 60 students doing five annotations in a given um, article. So what I would likely do is break, I would break it down into three groups of 20, for example, and that's trivial to do. In order to upload uh, content, 
into the perusal library, you simply come over here to the right hand side to this green add button. And you can, uh, nine times out of 10, people are adding documents from their computer. So these are readings that you already have a copy of and you would like your students to uh, experience. They can be Word documents, they can be PDFs, they can be EPUBs. Um, also note down here, Perusal can now allow your students to annotate video. So they can annotate various uh, parts of video. Uh, you can bring things from Dropbox. You can also annotate, have your students annotate web pages. So if there's an online journal or a contemporary news article that you would like your students to annotate, Perusal will take that website, uh, bring it down in an HTML5 format. It sort of ossifies it at that point and your students can annotate it. I should also mention that if you, when you are bringing PDFs, for example, onto your um, Perusal site. Perusal is extremely accessible. And what it does is it OCRs the PDFs that you bring to it and has a built-in screen reader so that students with visual impairments can have the not only the text itself read aloud, but they can also have the the commentary, the comments, the questions and the answers that their peers um, write, also those can be read aloud. So there's a wonderful built-in OCR functionality as well as a built-in screen reader that goes on uh, within Perusal. So you can see I have a number of um, articles here. I also have images. Um, Perusal is fantastic because you can also assign images for students to annotate. Uh, just a few minutes ago, we were talking about facsimiles and beautiful pages, etc. Students can annotate those. So how do you go about then taking something which is in the library and creating an assignment? Well, you simply choose that particular text and click here where it says assign. Um, you are able within Perusal to assign certain pages. So this is a particularly short one. I would likely do the entire thing. But if you were assigning a long uh, article which stretched for a number of pages, you could create one from page one to 47 and then another one from 48 to 103, for example. Once you've set that up, the range, you of course submit uh, a deadline or create a deadline. I recommend that you, you create a deadline about approximately 24 hours before your next synchronous class. So you have some time to go over what they have done and uh, what they have been thinking about. The assignment name is self-evident. The instructions for students is extremely important. The research that has been done on perusal, on student engagement with perusal has indicated that pre-reading prompts here within the instructions for students section are extremely important and much preferred over the instructor annotating directly in the text. What they have found through uh, research is that when instructors annotate the text themselves and pose questions or respond to questions directly in the text, the student engagement with the text is actually diminished. And that I think that makes sense if we all conjure up kind of pre-March uh, experience in the classroom. If you've ever broken your class up into small groups and asked them to discuss a certain uh, issue or idea, and at a certain point you leave the podium and you decide that you're gonna go filter around and sort of see what they're doing, Undoubtedly, you've had the experience of when you get physically present or close to one of those groups, the students pivot to you and suddenly, rather than conversing amongst themselves, start asking you questions, talking to you, and trying to kind of engage in that way. So we highly recommend thoughtful, intra, um, thoughtful uh, questions, here's prompts, super important. And the last section or part of creating an assignment is to decide how many annotations you would like the students to do. Most instructors I work with uh, ask their students to do anywhere between five and eight annotations per reading. Of course, that depends on complexity and length. 
And you can, of course, decide when that uh, particular assignment will be visible to your students. They can be anonymous, they can be optional, that's completely up to you. Um, I am now going to actually uh, go to one uh, of the readings here, which is a, an illuminated manuscript that Laura was, was uh, very helpful in, in forwarding to me. And if I click on open, you'll note that I am able to annotate this in two different ways. Either I can click and put a dot at a certain location on an image, and I can enter a, a comment here. You know, here is my comment, blah, blah, blah. Press return and that is entered. Or I could, for example, draw a rectangle around a particular aspect of that uh, image that I would like to comment on. And I can do this. But it, of course, is trivial to do this with text as well. Let me just uh, choose this one. And when I open it, I can go to a certain section of text, highlight what I'm interested in annotating, just do this, and and I would annotate and press return. And that is essentially the process that your students will do. Notice up here, because I am an instructor, I can see either my own comments. I could look at group A or group B or group C's annotations. I could hone in on a particular student and what she or he has annotated. I could look at only the questions, uh, only my comments, no comments at all, et cetera, et cetera. So there are a number of different ways that you can view it. And in fact, I recommend speaking to students about um, the possibility of reading initially anyway with no comments. I, I don't know about you, but I actually don't want to read with other people's annotations in the text the first time through. I like to read a clean copy so that I wrestle with the author, I wrestle with the thesis and the meaning and the text, then once I have gone through that and I've sort of roughly formula formulated some questions or some comments I'd like to make, then I might be curious to see what others have written uh, in that. Now I'm going to actually leave this, uh, this demonstration, this uh, fake class that I created here and show you a class that occurred in the spring so I can show you what student annotations look like from uh, your instructor's perspective. So this was a class that was uh, taught in our theology department here at Fordham University. And in this reading, you see the uh, pre-reading prompts here at the very beginning of the reading that the instructor has given his students. You'll notice the pie graph down at the bottom that gives you an overview of how uh, engaged the students were with that particular text. The uh, the program perusal will tell you how many comments in total, how many questions and unanswered questions. And this is particularly interesting. It will give you a sense of how much time the students spent on any given reading that you have assigned. You also get to see this uh, uh, section called upvoting. So like many social media uh, platforms, Perusal allows students to like other students' comments if they're enthralled or, or intrigued by that. That is known as upvoting within Perusal, and you get to see a short list of the most upvoted annotations uh, that have been uh, uh, noted by the peers. You get also get a listing to show you the most active students in the class and, of course, what comments they have made. You could break it down by looking at all comments. But to be honest with you, very few faculty have the time to look at all the comments of students. And you know, I think if you just do the math, if you have 20 students, they're doing five annotations, it's just too much. So instead, you can look at a confusion report that will show you the areas within the text where there was the most intense discussion. And you can look at an analytics panel. And again, this is available just to you where you can see how your students have been scored by perusal. 
it's important to note that Perusal has an artificial intelligence engine that automatically grades your students on a simplistic one to three scale. And you can uh, either accept that grading, uh, not accept it at all, or use it as a rough guide. I also highly recommend you think about the page view report. This will show you how many page views of each page your students are doing, how much time they are spending on a given page. If I had assigned this reading, for example, I might look at page 10 again and see if there's some concept which might be a bit of a stumbling block for them. And just to show you before I uh, have to leave it for um, other presenters and the questions, if I take a look at all of the conversation, I can jump to a certain annotation and see what's going on here. Student annotations are, of course, in yellow there. I can go down and take a look at other pages within the text. This one was done by the instructor. This one was done by a student. If I click on it, I see what is being done over here. Students uh, can annotate anonymously if they wish to do so. Uh, you can also tweak the grading uh, setup if you wish. That's perfectly allowable. And it's a fantastic and rich tool. I highly recommend it. 95% of you are assigning course readings anyway. This really builds community and is just, is just a wonderful tool. So I'll leave it at that. I think my time is pretty much up. And I will stop sharing. And back to you, Anne. That was excellent. Thank you so much, Sean. I, I love the idea of creating this community of readers, right, which is definitely something that we are after and want to continue, I think, to replicate uh, even in our, in our private little asynchronous spaces. <laughs> so it's, it's very exciting. Uh, our next presenter is, is Laura Morreale. And Laura is a cultural historian of the 13th and 14th, of 13th and 14th century Italian peninsula with research interests in medieval French language writing outside of France. She has created or managed over a dozen medieval digital projects, including the ongoing La, La Certa Challenge, uh, and serves as the co-PI of Harvard's Documentary Archaeology of Late Medieval Europe, or DALME, project. Laura is also currently the chair of the Digital Humanities and Multimedia Studies Committee for the MAA, as I mentioned, and she serves as a member of the CARI Executive Committee and has just been elected as one of the organization's counselors. So Laura, you are doing um, so much service for us and we are incredibly grateful to you for that and for your expertise in particular um, now, today in the digital realm. Uh, and you're gonna speak to us today, or is gonna speak to us today uh, about the Cronica Pisana transcribing together with From the Page. Great, thank you, Anne. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, share here. Does everybody see that? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. And I need to get rid of, sorry. Ah, oh, I need to get rid of my, there we are. All right, I'm going to uh, begin my, present, uh, my presentation today on the Cronica Pisana transcribing together with From the Page with a brief definition of my definition of transcription. Transcription is the act of transferring, um, in the case of medievalists, handwritten information from a manuscript or a digitized image of a manuscript to a keyboarded or machine readable version of that same material. In transcribing materials from medieval manuscripts, we are rendering a new version of a text or manuscript that is suited to the ways we now consume and manip manipulate text in the 21st century. Today, I'd like to talk about how this can be done in a classroom setting. And I'll do so using this example of the Cronica Pisana, a 14th century history of Pisa in a manuscript now housed at the British Library. I'll cover why transcription is a good activity for the classroom, how students might react when you ask them to, to, uh, to transcribe something, uh, one way to, to structure the assignment, some learning outcomes, and then um, beyond the transcription, what students might take away from this exercise for the future. Now, from the page is the transcription platform I use for research and for teaching. And you can see here how the platform works on this slide. Um, there's an image on one side of the screen, then a space for transcribing on the other. From the page has a very shallow learning curve. Most anyone can start transcribing within a matter of minutes of signing on. It tracks workflow almost effortlessly and keeps all the images, transcriptions, and other information about your project in one place. 
unfortunately, and this is the one drawback, it's not open source, um, but it's now supported by a number of institutions. So if you're interested in doing this kind of assignment, I would recommend that you reach out to your institution and see if they might support this. If you're an independent scholar like I am, you can purchase an individual research account and then take that with you where it, wherever it is that you teach. So let's talk a little bit about why transcription is so great in the classroom. Uh, when I create a transcription assignment, I always choose a manuscript I've not previously worked on because I like this to be an unmediated exercise. It's not material that I sort of thought up somewhere else and brought to the class, but it's an, act an activity that we're working on together, one that um, medievalists and other humanities scholars participate in often. Students then have the chance to see how that real work gets done and that they too can access um, or have access to some of the raw materials of our practice. And because the students and the instructor are partners in this effort, it tends to break down some of the student teacher hierarchy that at times sort of gets in the way of that learning. Um, it allows us to work through problems together because we're all um, gathered around this one text, this one manuscript, working through it together. And as we do so, as we work through this manuscript, students engage with the material on a very deep level. When you're working with a difficult reading of a manuscript, uh, doing so perhaps word by word, letter by letter, or even sometimes stroke by stroke, students start to really dig into the material and they're challenged to think creatively about how to make sense of what's there on the page in front of them. I also encourage, uh, it also encourages critical thinking about the source, and I'll talk about that a, a little bit more in just a moment. Um, but perhaps most importantly, um, working so closely with materials that were created by another human or another group of humans um, who left their marks so personally on this work, um, it allows for that really personal connection to the past in a very real and, and I would argue a very enduring way. So um, when you give this assignment to students, um, what are you going to expect to hear? Um, uh, I don't know how to do this. <laughs> Maybe they've never done anything like this before and it's kind of um, scary or frightening to them. Or this text goes on forever. Like, we'll, we'll, never, we'll never get it done. Uh, and my favorite, which is, you know, I don't read Latin or Spanish or Italian or whatever languages that medievalists um, are fond of studying. And so therefore I can't do this, um, which is really, really not the case. Um, by way of example, I will say that none of the students in the class that uh, transcribed the Corona Capizana had any Italian at all. But by the time we were done, they sure had figured out a lot of it. <laughs> and I would encourage you to, to reassure your students that um, language competencies aside, they really can do this. They really can uh, look at something on one side of the screen and then write it down in the other side. Um, and that um, this, this exercise as it is structured provides an entryway into understanding material that otherwise would probably remain impenetrable to them. Furthermore, by the end of the transcription effort, they too will be an expert, maybe one of the world's few experts on this person or these people, the people who created this, their graphic style. The metaphor that I use in encountering a new manuscript is that it's like meeting a new person. You have to get used to the quirks and the idiosyncrasies. Uh, you'll start to know this person, come to see where he or she is positioned vis-a-vis -vis this text how he or she is relating to this particular story um, and doing so in his or her own way. And um, that we can find that out uh, through what he, uh, she, or they have left to us uh, on the page. So now I'm gonna take you through how, how I structure a transcription assignment. The first thing that I do is to start students off with a very small selection of text, uh, depending on how compact the hand and how difficult the hand is, maybe just 15 or 20, 20 lines. And I always tell the students that this is going to be the most difficult transcription uh, session that they undertake, because they're still sort of just getting used to, to knowing the hand, getting acquainted with the scribe and, and how the scribe does things. Now students will take this small selection and make their way through it the best they can. Now they will need to have um, their first effort, their, their first pass through done and then back to me at least 24 hours before we all come together, uh, whether we do this virtually or physically, to discuss the manuscript. Now you can see here in the middle pane of this slide that a student submitted his first attempt and that I was then able to come in very shortly thereafter, and this is what the platform really facilitates, um, to come in um, very shortly thereafter, make corrections, um, and these corrections appeared side by side with his own uh, transcription. 
So he was then able to compare and to sort of discover the things that were difficult or confusing for him in his first pass through. Now, once we've all done our first sessions, each student has done um, his or her um, pass through. Um, the next step is for the whole class to come together to talk about the manuscript, uh, to find the keys to unlock what's difficult or unique about our manuscript. And here uh, we'll talk about characteristic letter forms. You know, I hate how the S and T goes together. What's that weird CH thing that keeps showing up? Things like that. Um, we'll talk about abbreviations, um, options for expanding them, for example, how punctuation works, word separation, all those sorts of things. And then finally, and perhaps most importantly, um, we'll talk about what remains unresolved. We'll talk about the problems that we're encountering in this manuscript, what we can't, what we can't solve. And I find that um, if, or, or rather when, I admit that I don't know what something means, um, it's really empowering for the students. Um, that in fact, not knowing what something is, is a normal part of this process. And that we can all work on it together to find a solution. So it's at this point that I provide students with some of the tools that we might use to resolve these questions. And you'll see here that these are the ones I use for this particular project. Uh, here we have a dictionary of medieval Italian. We have a paleography tutorial, the Capelli, which many of us know, it's just a reference for abbreviations. And then finally, I have here a very specialized resource, the Encyclopedia of Medieval Chronicle, that might help us decipher um, you know, the Cronica Pisana, naturally. And then ultimately what I'll say to the students if they've tried all these other things and they just can't find something, I say, well, you know, just, just Google it. <laughs> just, just throw it out into the internet and, and we'll see what comes back. And, um, and I want to stress here, and I stress to the students, um, that in this exercise, there's absolutely, there's no cheating. There's no way to cheat. Uh, you can look at your peers' work. You can look at my work. I want you to look at my work. <laughs> and you can look anywhere else uh, that might help solve the problem that we're facing. Um, and that in fact, doing this, it, it's not cheating, it's what we call research. <laughs> and um, that this is where that critical thinking component really comes in, where students should, be, should begin to ask, um, how authoritative is this resource that offers a solution to my problem? Can I trust it? Uh, and more importantly, can I get my teammates to trust it? What argument might I make to my team members to convince them that my solution is the right one? Now, students might even have to go to find other resources to make their case. And so for me, I think this is a really great way to encourage critical thinking and how to amass evidence to support one interpretation over the other, which is of course what we do in a lot of our humanities work uh, all the time. Now, once we've done our small selection, I'll divide up the rest of the transcription, however long it happens to be, um, into particular chunks, and then I'll give each student his or her own chunk. Uh, I use a transcription log. Um, this one is in Google Sheets, uh, and I can certainly uh, share that with anyone who's interested. Um, as a centralized place to track who has done what on the project, what's been completed, discoveries, reactions, unresolved questions, um, some encouragement sometimes, and it really serves as a kind of textual meeting place where we keep track of the project, and in some ways we, we keep track of each other. Once each page has been transcribed, then it must be reviewed. And of course, for each page, the transcriber and the reviewer should be different. And I find that this really facilitates some, some great peer-to-peer -peer teaching. And as I said before, I'm always involved in this process. I'm always gonna do my little, my little chunk. And I want students to review my work because in fact, I want to see them, I want them to see the errors that I make, right? And of course, at the same time, they may also be learning things from me uh, and from their peers that they can then go back um, and use in their own transcriptions and make the corrections that they need to make. And um, they should always enter their unresolved questions into the log sheet because perhaps another student may have encountered the same issue and, and, and resolved it, and then they can reach out and offer a solution to the classmate, uh, which of course is also empowering and it builds, uh, helps to build this community around this, this manuscript. Now, uh, as students begin to hit their stride, they're feeling good about the manuscript, uh, as they invariably do, um, project participants should start talking about the editorial norms they would like to use uh, for the particular edition that we are creating together. What kind of edition are we making? Is it a semi-diplomatic edition? Is it a critical edition? 
what should we do with all these Arabic and Roman numerals, the chapter headings, rubrics, initials, marginalia, brackets, braces, all these things that we all know and that we come across when we deal with manuscripts. Um, as students are making decisions about the edition they're creating, I think that it teaches them um, that the same kinds of decisions uh, were made about many of the printed texts that they encounter outside of this class. Uh, and that other scholars, editors, and publishers, for example, may also have, have intervened to produce the things that they read and they're used to reading elsewhere. So I think it's a wonderful exercise in that way. And so what are some of the things that you, you, he, you might hear during, during the process of these exercise, this exercise? I'm not gonna read them all, but just some examples. Um, you know, why is the scribe breaking this up into paragraphs like this? Are these paragraphs, are these sections? You know, why is the marginalia in a different ink? Does that mean more than one person was involved in the production of this manuscript? And of course, the last thing, which I think is the most important, um, is that students start to get this really um, deep sort of love-hate relationship with the scribe. So they'll say things like, you know, well, this, this part was amazing. This, this part was just great and so beautiful. Um, but the, that, that P thing he does, that's just so annoying. And, and, and why, you know, why is one word spelled the same uh, on one page and then differently on two different type, you know, parts of the page? So really this kind of engagement at a very, very personal level. And, and that's um, exciting for the students and of course exciting for the, for the instructor to feel that way as well. So, so once you have fully transcribed your text, you can use it in any way you'd like. Um, here, in this case, we did a collation of our manuscript with a version of our text um, based on a different manuscript witness that was printed in the 18th century. Our manuscript featured 24 extra lines not found in the printed edition, uh, and it listed the names of dozens of Pisans who had perished in a flood in the early part of the century by, by name. And the students were very excited to be able to then contribute that information back to the story of this text. Another thing that you can do, and which we did too, uh, was to tag the text um, according to the different ways that the author marked time in this chronicle, whether it was done according to calendrical or the liturgical year, by time of day, et cetera, et cetera. We were then able to export that data, and that's very easy to do within the uh, context of the platform. We exported it out to Google Sheets, and then we could visualize this data with you know, very easy basic graphs, um, which allowed us to ask different kinds of questions of the text than we normally would have. And then finally, I'm just gonna bring up, um, I was really inspired by the suggestions of Sarah Powell at the NAA webinar yesterday on race and teaching. And it got me thinking that uh, transcribing manuscripts or even parts of manuscripts may also open spaces to have important conversations about cross-cultural, cross-confessional, or interracial contact in the Middle Ages. And we can see that really plainly here in this 12th century uh, trilingual Psalter from Sicily. Here we see it, in, it includes Greek, Latin, and Arabic scripts. Now seeking out manuscripts like this for, transcri for transcription assignments might allow for the kinds of conversations that we're all hoping to bring to our teaching these days. Um, so I, I find transcription to be a very effective and an enduring classroom activity. Um, and if that, uh, with that, I will just close and thank you all for your attention. Great, thank you so much, Laura. That, that's um, so inspiring and super fun. And I will um, put in another plug for From the Page because as you've all no doubt discovered during this webinar, I'm fairly digitally illiterate and Laura and I have used it and I was able to learn it in a heartbeat. So, um, so it is an incredibly friendly uh, program in, in that way. And uh, I just also wanna thank you, Laura, for that final slide because that was, um, speaks to some questions that have come up uh, and, and also just such a perfect example um, to, to pull out from kind of bridging the conversation from yesterday to today. So thank you. Um, I'll just add, I can see questions are mounting here. I can see my questions again. So I will begin to pose them. I think I will wait until the end, though there are some questions that are grouped based on the different types of um, resources we've, we've heard um, from so far or heard about so far. But um, let's move to our final presentation, which is in fact a joint presentation uh, with, with two art historians. And our goal here was also was to kind of put them in conversation with each other, because I think a lot of us have been um, talking to each other about ideas we've had, things that have worked last semester, things we hope to do uh, in the future. And so this seemed like a, a nice um, opportunity to bring two people together to, to do that. So um, our two presenters today uh, are Pamela Patton, who has been director of the Index of 
medieval art at Princeton University since 2015. And prior to this, she was professor and chair of art history at Southern Methodist University. Her scholarship and teaching center on the visual culture of medieval Spain and its environs, particularly the role of the image in articulating cultural identity and social dynamics among multi-ethnic communities in the Iberian Peninsula. And Pamela will be in conversation with Elena Gersman, who is Professor of Medieval Art and the Archbishop Paul J. Hallman Professor of a Professor in Catholic Studies too. Is that how I say it? <laughs> Okay, <laughs> it's a great title, long mouthful, at Case Western Reserve University. In addition to numerous articles, she has authored, authored The Dance of Death in the Middle Ages, Image, Text, and Performance, published in 2010, which won the John Nicholas Brown Prize from the MAA that year for Best First Book in Medieval Studies. Uh, she's also the author of Worlds Within, Opening the Medieval Shrine Madonna, published 2015, which was the winner of the Karen Gould Prize in Art History from the MAA. Uh, and her most recent book, The Middle Ages and 50 Objects, published in 2018, co-authored with Barbara Rosenwein. She's also the editor of numerous other books. I'll just list them because I think they're important for us to, to keep in mind, but vis uh, Visualizing Medieval Performance, Perspectives, Histories, Contexts, Crying in the Middle Ages, Tears of History, and uh, Animating Medieval Art, a guest edited issue of the journal uh, pr uh, Preacher, Preacher Nature, excuse me, and co-edited uh, Thresholds of Medieval Visual Culture Liminal Spaces. She has many other projects underway and that she has undertaken, including uh, a catalog and a com that accompanied the focused exhibit that she co-curated with Stephen Fiegel, Myth and Mystique Cleveland's Gothic Table Fountain in 2016. And her work has been sponsored by Guggenheim, The Crest, Mellon, Franco-American Culture Exchange Foundations, and, American, and the American Council for Learned Societies. Um, so she has many projects underway that will um, bring us uh, in conversation here with, with Pamela Patton, as well as I think in and out of the, the Cleveland collection, which is extremely inspiring. Today, their presentation is entitled Curating in the Art History Classroom, Objects, Images, and Innovation from Afar. Thank you both. Well, thank you. I, I think I'm going to get started. Um, I'll talk for a few minutes and I'll, I'll hand it to Alina. And so what I'm doing is the sort of uh, nuts and bolts part, and then she'll do the really cool part. <laughs> so, and let me just uh, share my screen. And everybody can see that? That, that leper is where I am right now. Um, I'm sorry to say. Uh, so this, this was an interesting opportunity. I really appreciate it because I think this is a a turn that many of us who teach art history have taken in the last, um, you know, three months, um, more or less deliberately. And Elena and I both uh, jumped into it in very different places and I had a really, really interesting conversation about what we thought worked and what didn't work. So um, I'll, I'll, what I'd like to do is sort of build on Liz Laster's really cool presentation last week on using art steps for virtual exhibitions. Um, which is sort of the how of the assignment. This is one way you can do it by talking a little bit more about the why and specifically about how the strategies and objectives that are behind a virtual exhibition assignment um, can work for us in a time of COVID-19, especially as a remote friendly alternative to a more traditional research paper, which is essentially what it was for me and my class. Um, I'll talk briefly about the goals and structure of the assignment and how they map onto a traditional uh, research assignment. And then Alina is going to share some examples of virtual exhibitions that she's done recently. And um, so let's see how all this, I got two screens going. So if something doesn't work, just someone wave at me. Um, <clears throat> one of my greatest frustrations with COVID-19, and we all have many, um, was the student's lack of access to both research resources and actual works of art. Um, this is one that I know we all share to some extent. Uh, for, for me in particular, it's very frustrating because my assignment for this particular class was a 15 page object based research paper. And suddenly my students couldn't see the objects and they couldn't get to the specialized sources that they needed to write that paper. And so um, casting about these, these were upper level undergraduates um, trying to sort of decide what to do with these very bright, very ambitious people who now couldn't get to the stuff that they needed. 
um, I decided to look back at a virtual exhibition assignment that I'd used in the past at SMU um, with students who were interested in museum work and to see if I could retool it to serve the purpose I needed now. And that um, surprised me by working quite well. Um, a virtual exhibition, just, just to sort of give you a sense of it, and those of you who tuned in last week have already heard a little of this from Liz, a virtual exhibition assignment can take many forms um, from a simple assemblage of texts and images, which in my case is all we could manage, you know, give me text, give me pictures, um, to a, a web or app-based product that's really interesting and inspiring, like the ones that Liz demonstrated with Art Steps. If I had had time and awareness, I would have jumped right into Art Steps. I think that would have been a great way to go. Um, the core elements of an exhibition like this are really quite simple. Um, you need wall and gallery texts that explain the exhibition's theme and the question or the idea that it explores. Um, you need images of representative works of art, which generally are found in online museum collections. And um, of course, you need student written labels, not copied from the site, but written, originated by the students that explain their relationship to the gallery and the exhibition theme. Um, a reading list or bibliography, which I always assign as a way of sort of seeing what the students have been using, but also as um, an ostensible list of reading for the, the gallery visitor. And then, of course, there are lots of other things. Uh, as Alina will share, you can expand this with uh, lots of other components, like an exhibition proposal or grant applications or loan request letters, um, many, many things, a catalog, many things that would accompany a real exhibition. Um, the original objectives of my research assignment had been for students to do the following. I gave you a little diagram. This is because at SMU, we were all about those student learning objectives, and they taught us how to do all this EduSpeak stuff. So here it is, official EduSpeak. Um, the objectives were to engage as directly as possible with at least one actual work of art as an entry point into studying medieval Iberian visual culture, which was our particular course topic, um, to formulate and pursue a self-generated question inspired by this object. Hand that to the students. What question do you have? What question do you want to explore? Um, third, to discover and use the specialized scholarship that would help them answer the question. Um, in a perfect world, that's beautiful. You send them to the Met, they find an object, they think about it, they do some research, and they write a paper. Um, all of these contribute, of course, to core competencies in art history that uh, are quite important for majors, but really any student taking the course, especially the ability to analyze multiple aspects of specific works of art in relation to historical context. So not to see them as a flat document or as a pretty picture of how things were, but as, as an object that functioned and existed in the Middle Ages and contributes to our knowledge of the medieval world. Um, the, the virtual exhibition assignment surprised me in a way by replacing these objectives a little better than I expected. Um, one did not surprise me. Objective two translates fairly easily to online work since a good digital image of a work of art is, you know, it's going to inspire art historical questions, even if they're not quite the same ones that would be inspired by an object that you're looking at in real life. Um, the other objectives looked like they would be harder. Engaging directly with works of art, obviously, is hard to do when the museum is closed. And working with specialized scholarship, as I think we've all learned, is really, really difficult when the library is shut and you may or may not have good online access to the kinds of sources you need. Um, but the assignment allowed for some adaptations that I, I found very successful, and uh, which is why I <laughs> responded to the call for, for discussion that was put out a while ago by Medieval Academy. Um, first of all, the online museum databases where the students found the works of art for their exhibition often include not just high quality images, but a lot of other key information, dimensions, medium, condition reports, um, multiple views, things that really helped you to approximate, at least as well as could be hoped, uh, the sort of real life engagement with the object that was the original goal. And second, the scholarly information in museum databases has become increasingly abundant and sophisticated which helps to fill the holes created by limited library access. You can go to, to some sites, um, the Met is a really good example, where you can see bibliography, you can see provenance, you can see a, a, an informative label, you can also see links to other resources. So even though it's not the kind of depth and specialization that I would have hoped for in a traditional research paper, um, it was an opportunity to think really fully about these works and the kinds of information that they could get to 
that um, would, would inform them about them. So the result was an assignment that, that did the things I hoped the research paper would do. It encouraged visual and material literacy, it encouraged historical and analytical skills, and the scholarly and critical judgment um, that I wanted the students to come away with. Um, but it also did something that uh, was sort of a bonus that a research paper would not have done, and that is that it allowed them to develop some very important competencies related to museum practice, right? Useful training for students who might find themselves working in a museum someday. And that is not just art history majors, by the way, because the job market is terrible, right? So your history majors and your English majors are probably thinking about libraries and museums as, as a pretty viable career track, as they should. Um, so working through an assignment like this helps them also to think about what museums do, how objects are handled and thought about in a museum context. So um, I, I found it was really a much richer result than I had expected, considering it was sort of a contingency plan. Um, and since Alina has used versions and aspects of this assignment very, very frequently, more frequently than I have, and more recently, um, she'll have a lot more to say about the ways in which these assignments can be structured. So I'll hand it over to her. Thank you. So um, I am going to share my screen. My desktop exploded recently, so this might be fraught. Is all good? Are we good? We're we good. Things. Fantastic. All right. All right, and let's go. Okay. So, um, one of the things that um, I've encountered in, right, um, Pamela is right that we had some really fabulous conversations um, and that we both experienced, you know, the same disruption to our regular teaching activity. And then our solution was very similar. That is, take the regular research project and then flip it into uh, the virtual exhibition. Um, so what I want to talk about today, uh, following up on what Pamela said and on what Liz said uh, last week, uh, is a way to structure this kind of assignment. And the assignment is the proposing an exhibition, essentially. Um, how it can be done online without you know, much recourse to the libraries um, and printed sources at the moment. Um, so the general the general assignment here of proposing an exhibition can be broken down into several sections. A proposal per se, signage, so labels, subpanels, introductory wall texts, anything really you, you, you want, you can pick and choose. Programming, which uh, students always have great fun with. Uh, writing a catalog entry, putting together a bibliography and if possible an annotated bibliography and then doing a presentation, which is not your garden variety academic presentation, but rather a presentation that you would pitch to your museum colleagues um, uh, trying to get funding for your um, exhibition. So one of the first things that um, you would want to do is to have your students determine your venue. Um, they can pick any museum in the world. It can be Louvre, it can be British Museum. Uh, you know, by default, um, you know, we always pick the Cleveland Museum of Art because we know it so well. Um, and um, for the purposes of the show that we did for Myth and Mystique that, um, um, that uh, Anne mentioned, we picked the Focus Gallery at the Cleveland Museum of Art. You also want to have your students develop a timeline and you have to be, you have to teach them realistic expectations. So when will your show take place? When will your checklist have to be, you know, finalized, say December 2020 is when you want your checklist done. January 2021 is when you want to write your loan letters. February 2022, 21, when the forms are mailed. In April of that year, you want to approach your catalog authors. In October, your catalog text is due, things like that. So it gets them to think about you know, these real challenges of putting together um, something that involves uh, collaboration. 
for the very first assignment, after you determine venues and dates, um, I suggest you have them come up with a working title and you warn them that their working title is going to go through a lot of iterations and torture by marketing and publicity people in the museum and that they will not end up with what they want to end up with uh, more often than not. And that is just the way um, life is. Um, the rest of the proposal generally consists of basic concept and content. So um, you ask your students to, in, to uh, mention their target audience. So for example, when we did the fountain show, this focus table fountain show, um, we stress the relevance of the exhibition for our venue, saying that we have a lot of material from Valois Burgundy. This is the this is the information that is easily available um, at any museum. You know, if you want to uh, put up a show in British Library, while well, you have glorious manuscripts there uh, for the CMA. Burgundian show just made perfect sense. Uh, you have students mention things that your museum has. Um, so in our case, you know, the mourners uh, from the Ducal tombs or Jean de Bometz's paintings, things like that. And then for audience appeal, you, you have your students think, what would the lay audiences want? We, of course, went with, you know, sumptuousness with recognizable names. Jan van Eyck got thrown in. Historical associations with a vibrant era, 100 Year War, um, you know, Order of the Golden Fleece, wonderful things like that. And then you have your students think uh, who the show is for, so what the audience is. One of the most interesting things that they have, well, actually, a couple of things that they need to do, uh, they need to know what the precedence of your exhibition is. So, did your museum put together something like this before? <clears throat> so, for the fountain exhibit, we said, well, CMA put together this wonderful Dukes and Angels show uh, that dealt with one Duke with, you know, Philip the Bold and then John the Fearless. And then another show is coming in a couple of years and it's on the third Duke. And this is going to serve as a bridge. So once again, it starts students thinking about the relevance of the collection and also they start doing research, which is you know, basic online research. What did museums do before? Um, they need to decide whether they want to have a catalog or a gallery guide or brochure, and then they need to supply you with checklist. And this particular um, part of the assignment maps onto what Pamela mentioned as one of the objectives, which is engaging with objects through online museum databases and similar online resources. So for your checklist, um, you know, it should look like this. So this is our part of our Cleveland Table Fountain checklist, and it should include the scope of your show. Um, and you have to figure out the anticipated size, critical works, photos, dimensions, reasons, location. So don't ask your students about the budget because you imagine that uh, you have all the money in the world and you can secure any loans. Um, if there is a gallery at, or a museum that is affiliated with your school or even unaffiliated but nearby, see if your students can contact the curator <clears throat> and have an informal chat now that it's on Zoom. Um, I think they might be able to, um, it, 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 it might be a likelier possibility than before. There is a panoply of different um, resources that they can study. Uh, the Arts and Artifacts International Indemnity Program is one of the most important ones. So they really get into the process of, you know, how do you secure the loans? You know, how do you do the exchange? How does it work? So this is one of the first key assignments. And we tend to have students circulate the draft um, of their paper for peer feedback, and then I would provide my feedback and then revise it at least once, um, preferably a couple of times. The second assignment, once they have their exhibition proposal set, is what it is that they're going to show to the public. So signage. 
signage is very important. Um, and here I'm using um, images from the Treasures of Heaven, the glorious show that was, uh, that took place at the CMA a few years ago. And that was a huge show. Um, and there you would find an introductory wall panel, a set of sub panels, and then of course, object labels. So for your introductory um, wall panels, I mean, what do you want to do? You want your students to go once again and explore the websites of the museum that they're interested in. Um, how did this museum do exhibitions in the past? You will find, they will be able to find examples of wall panels and sub panels and certainly object labels online. So their language has to fit with the particular needs of their chosen museum. Um, the introductory wall panel allows them to do broad research, right? They need to deal with geography and chronology and history and culture and main idea and conceptual framework and all in 200 words and so. And it's always held for them to think about. Um, Sub-panel for a group of objects has to be shorter, max 150 words. So what unites a specific group of objects? Um, so if the wall panel is kind of like an introduction to your book, the sub-panel is, you know, it's a section, it's a chapter. And then there is the object label. <clears throat> and as Pamela already mentioned, they will be able to see the way that their objects are described online in other museums. Um, so this assignment teaches them not just to paraphrase, but to write their own label, their own description that is keyed specifically to the theme of the exhibition. So instead of you know, regurgitating the same information over and over, you know, an interesting fact, who is the patron, what's the cultural context, they need to key it to your specific show, right? Um, it's a very tough assignment, that last thing. Um, they cannot use theoretical language. They cannot use jargon. Again, they have to keep their audiences in mind. And I can tell you, so th these are the courses that I generally tend to pitch to graduate students. And it is extremely hard for them to hone their language, uh, to make it accessible to intelligent general public. Once they're done with that, I would suggest that their third assignment, which by far for them is the funnest assignment, is programming. And they have to think once again, their research is online. Their programming, it should be about a thousand words. Um, they need to go and research what their museums did previously for their previous shows. Did they do exhibition tours? Were there lectures? Who came? So they have to propose the curators and scholars who would come. Were there docent tours? Were there panel discussions? Um, for the fountain show, for the you know, burgundy show, metalworking demonstrations are always a hit. Medieval music performances. We had um, case westerns in Oberlin. Students come and sing in the galleries and play in the galleries. And, and it was glorious. For the uh, Treasures of Heaven, um, the CMA Studio Art uh, put together a medieval revelry, Family and Community Day, and they uh, teamed up with the Society for Creative Anachronism, believe it or not, and they had, you know, pilgrims batch making and manuscript making, and kids had great fun. But this is something that uh, students have to think about and make it compelling. Now, if you want to depress them a little bit, you might want to remind them that their show might take place during um, you know, a pandemic, and therefore, what sorts of programming can they come up with that are you know, pandemic friendly? Or you can simply say, look, we, we presume that by the time your show opens, everything will be fine. And so let's proceed as usual. The fourth assignment um, is probably more you know, geared towards um, graduate students or advanced undergraduates. Ask them to write a catalog entry 
or a gallery guide essay, once again, decide what it is that they need uh, to have for their show. Uh, explain to them the difference uh, between, you know, a gallery guide, a brochure, and a catalog. Um, and if it's possible, have your students consult entries in recent exhibition catalogs. If your library is closed and interlibrary loan is not working, this is a little bit tougher. Uh, but once again, you can find bits and pieces of it on the museum's website. So this is um, this, along with a general bibliography, uh, is something that will help them. Um, and once again, kind of map it onto um, the, the, the in-depth research objective. How do you discover and use the specialized scholarship that will support the design and didactic materials for your exhibition? Ask them to break it down into primary and secondary sources. Have them have sections on general topics and specific objects. Have them remember general interest books. That is what you want your shop essentially to carry. Um, Again, this is doable online. Um, if they have better access to libraries, annotated bibliographies, quite obviously, uh, are most useful. And then the final assignment is a presentation. Um, we tend to give them 15 minutes with five minutes for Q&A. Um, this is not their normal presentation. This is a pitch, and they should think about it as such and they should expect questions about I mean, how doable is it to put something like this together? What kind of material support will they need? What about their space? What about the loans? So it's a pitch to excite their colleagues, but also to prepare to answer questions that necessitate more research into the objects. How heavy are they? How will you have to mount them? You know, will they break the floor in the gallery? Um, and um, given that, you know, talking on Zoom is in the new normal, this is also will offer them training for pitching these things online. So with that, I'm going to escape my stop share because I can't see anybody. Um, and yeah, I think we'll open it to questions unless Pamela has something to add. Okay. Great, um, wonderful. Thank you both so much. Uh, it's incredibly inspiring to think about how students yeah, can interact with these objects. But also, Elena, in your last slide, it was really evocative for me that the digital does offer us, as we spoke about with manuscripts, the ability to, to kind of come in so close to these objects and yeah. see them and think about, again, the haptic quality of all of this and opens up other lines of questions too. So thank you. Um, well, we're going to, I think the best course of action is, is going to force us to jump around a little bit in terms of these different tools, because um, I think I will return us to questions and sort of open the floor, as it were, to questions. And I just want to encourage attendees that um, if they do have questions to keep, keep them coming, keep posting them. Um, I'm going to turn now to some of the questions that have come in. And I do want to say some of them have been um, answered, as it were, uh, responded to by various presenters already. Um, I, I'm going to try and group some of the questions together, and they mostly have to do with um, the different tools that were presented. So if we start with um, Prusal, uh, I'm not sure if I'm saying that quite right, Sean, you can correct me. Um, there were a number of questions uh, about it as a, a platform and a technology, I guess is one way of putting it, um, and that it offers certain things that other analogous programs maybe uh, have certain restrictions. So you did answer this, but I think it's an important question, Sean. For example, how Perusal versus something like uh, Google works um, in terms of both accessibility, but also tracking students' interactions with, or tracking information about student, student data, right? So that's something that we all need to be sort of aware of and, and maybe worry about or attentive to um, at this particular time. It sounds like Perusal is, is better for that kind of um, freedom, particularly, for example, international students, students um, that we're teaching who uh, are from China, for example, um, and that Prusal may, may offer a, a better platform for students um, to deal with well, that. I, I think, Ed, that the, because Perusal 
was developed by academics for the academic environment. Mm -hmm. um, issues like FERPA compliance in America and other student data related questions were already foremost in their minds when this tool was created. Other tools like Google Docs, for example, or Hypothesis are fascinating and interesting and can be used pedagogically, of course, but they were not developed by, for, and with, with the understanding that a professor at Harvard has about the sanctity of you know, student information and data, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I will, however, say one of the differences is that perusal is also simultaneously a pedagogical experiment that the team uh, that has developed it is very interested in learning how strategies of use of perusal can impact student outcomes. And so some of the data that I included in one of the links there talks about the limited data that they do collect in order to assess how long do students uh, read documents for? Um, how much time do they spend at the beginning of a document, at the middle of a document, at the end of a document? Um, who annotates? When in the semester do they annotate, et cetera? It's all anonymized, so it's not as though they know that, you know, Mary or Timmy or Jane did this or did that, but uh, it is nevertheless um, source material that they have used as researchers and published in peer-reviewed journals about usage and what they have discovered um, from the process. But I think the key is it's, it's an academic program developed by academics within higher education in America and fully reflects the concerns that, that come up about those issues. Great, that's really helpful. And I think that comment about the FERPA information um, oh, really yeah. does address <laughs> all of these sorts of worries. Yeah, uh, and that, of course that data collection aspect of use waste is gonna be really important for augmenting and tweaking the tool going forward. So um, good, thanks. Um, another sort of related question in thinking about um, usage and copyright in particular is that there are a number of questions that were posed about the different kinds of text that you can use with it. Um, so you showed us um, PDFs uh, of um, articles and uh, portions, it seems, of some books. What about textbooks or online textbooks? Very good um, question. A question yeah. about images. You showed us an image. So I think right. the image and video capability. Can you just talk a little bit sure. more about that? If you were able to use a document in your class in the kind of physical world in the kind of pre, you know, March era, then you can use it within perusal. In other words, if you had fair use rights to that article, and I'm, I'm not a copyright lawyer, I'm not even a librarian, but in general, we're looking at things like duration, is it for a short period of time, AKA one semester, limited audience, are you releasing this to the entire university or to the entire world? No, you're just keeping it to your uh, select class. And also, is it, uh, simply part of a larger document, uh, book, chapter, whatever it is, and not the essence, at least in American law, not the essence of, of that thing. So if you had fair use rights to use that thing in your class pre-March, you can throw it into perusal, no problem. But here's where I want to give a shout out to librarians. And I think we need to always as, as instructors realize the incredible, you know, intellectual and, and, and legal resources that they represent at our institutions. And if you have any questions about, can I use this thing, go to your librarian. They are just, they're just gods um, and done wonderful things, um, especially during this, this COVID era. But as for the question about textbooks, Perusal gives it away for free the way in which they make money on this project, or at least cover their costs, is that if you assign an entire book, usually a textbook, or it could be some source material, that is still within copyright, Perusal will reach out to the publisher on your behalf and say, hey, could we get this source book into Perusal? If the publisher agrees, they will release a digital copy 
to your students that your students would have to purchase and perusal will get a certain cut of that purchase price. So again, I think it's always important to think about origin stories when we're thinking about technology. And because this came from a scientist's brain, he was thinking about those $400, $350 Biology 101 course books and the fact that the digital version is only 250 and they become obsolete within a year or two anyway. So for, from his perspective, he may have thought this is an awesome way to go about it. For you and for us as humanists and medievalists, the idea of a source book becoming obsolete is a little bit odd. I mean, I know things do change, but nevertheless, it's not like the treadmill of the sciences where, you know, every couple of years, a new version of that textbook comes out. But again, Perusa will reach out to any publisher that you're interested in working with and we'll find out if they will release a digital version for annotation. So, uh, but again, I, I think you may need to rely on a combination of the physical book. I mean, just look behind me and look behind half of you, right? <laughs> um, and there may be some digital affordances and there are obviously gonna be some physical affordances. And you've, you know, you always have to kind of think those things through. Maybe one last one last question for you, Sean, and then we can move on. But yes, yeah, so there were other questions about images, which I think you covered, video, which you covered. How about podcasts? Because we just recently heard about podcasts as <laughs> another tool. Is it possible to upload and then comment on in the same way? That might be too specific, and people can go into the program and play around a bit. I I want to say yes, but I don't actually know. And the reason I don't know is the ability to annotate video only came on, uh, it was a, it's a soft launch and it came out in, on the 1st of July. So it's very, very new um, and I haven't explored it fully, but that's a very good question. I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Okay, great. Yeah, and I think, um, but this is definitely a moment where I'm certainly inspired to take that extra step and write to these kinds of companies so that we can push them to develop things that they never would have, you know, in the pre-COVID moment or not hearing from humanists and, and things like that. So I think that's um, really important for us to take quite Right, and this would tie in beautifully with, with Nick Paul's discussion last week. Uh, you know, if your students were producing really, really interesting content, uh, is there a way that subsequent classes, you know, the next year, the following year, the third year after that, they could listen to those podcasts and uh, interrogate them? Thanks, John. Um, Laura, I'm going to turn to you and again try and aggregate um, a couple questions into one larger question, which is that a number of people wrote to ask um, if this is, and I think the answer is yes, given the last slide you showed us, but if this is a platform that would be um, feasible for using with non-Latin alphabets, Greek, Arabic, Hebrew, et cetera, to do this similar kind of work. And then sort of related to that or um, built in maybe or a second uh, coda to that question um, would be what level of students do you use this kind of um, exercise with? Because obviously it's an exercise of a paleography and transcription as well as a number of other things that go along with coming to understand the codicology of a whole text composition of a manuscript and a coherent chronicle etc but is it something you see applicable for students um, obviously small sets of students but uh, from undergraduate beginning undergraduate audiences through graduate or what would you say yeah, so I'll answer that part first and then move on to the question of the non-Latin scripts. Um, you know, I have used it with sort of upper level uh, undergraduates and with graduate students effectively. Um, and of course, I think you could skew it any way you wanted. I mean, we all know of, um, you know, a Carolingian script might be, <laughs> might be easier to, to, to decipher than I would, you know, I wouldn't give them Mercantesca, you know, <laughs> to, to try to deal with, right? So, I mean, you can certainly find um, different levels of difficulty within the manuscripts that we all have access to digitally now. And, um, and you know, that's, um, uh, I, I really do think that having students work on something actual and real um, is so uh, inspiring to them and, and might inspire them to take the next step to do the more difficult thing, right? Um, and, you know, this exercise is not meant to replicate an entire paleography course or a course in codecology or any of the expertises that, you know, are frankly beyond my, my ability. I'm just sort of a workaday 
medievalist and I like to, you know, work with manuscripts. Um, and so to me, it's, it's um, you know, I, I, I want students to know what's in the manuscripts too, what, you know, what the, what the story is that's being told. And so I might only focus on, you know, trying to get, um, to get, you know, the, the information transferred to something that we can all deal with um, otherwise. Uh, so I think you can use it in whatever way speaks to your own competencies, right? Um, as to the non-Latin scripts, I mean, I have to admit that I really um, just was inspired by uh, Sarah Powell yesterday to, to sort of go and look and see what I might find. And um, I haven't done that at all um, in any classes, but it, it made me stop and think, well, what really could you do? So maybe you could start off with the Latin script and then maybe you could um, have students go to Google Translate <laughs> and see what they might find with the Latin stuff that they did. And then see, you know, if, if they could sort of translate it into one of the other scripts and does it look the same or does it look different? And, you know, to some extent, you know, it's, um, uh, it's a way to ask questions and it's a way to open that space to see what cross-cultural um, conversations look like. So I, um, and, you know, it may very well be that there are students in your class who have um, expertise in these other scripts. Right, and that might be a way to to make that person the the specialist uh, in a way that you know potentially um, we don't pay attention to otherwise. But you know, it's it's just a possibility. Um, maybe two years from now, I come back and tell you how I've done it. But I haven't done it yet. But I like I said, I was just inspired by that, and I thought we could think differently um, using those tools. Great, and I assume if someone were teaching a class um, in Hebrew about Hebrew texts, you could do the same thing uh, with the Hebrew text that you've done here with, with Latin or Greek for that matter. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I know for sure that from the page does accommodate um, right to left and left to right. So yeah, they, yeah, they're, they're, they're on that. Great, thanks. Good. And then we have a question for uh, Elena and Pamela. Um, are there specific advantages or disadvantages to the exhibition assignments in a remote learning context that those who have used such assignments <laughs> for face-to-face -face learning should keep in mind? So. Uh, there are definitely disadvantages. Um, I mean, I think there are advantages too. Um, there's, there is no replacement for a live physical encounter with a work of art. And there are things you learn from being in the same space as a work of art that you will not learn any other way. You can't see surface, you can't see the back, you can't get a sense of scale, you can't think about condition. None of that stuff happens in the same way if you're looking at a digital image. And so there's always that. You're always losing that. But I, I think there are probably positives that I haven't, you know, that I've just been starting to digest. Um, and since Alina has been doing this longer than I have, maybe, you know, she could speak to that. So I will... Um offer a slightly more optimistic, <laughs> which is very unusual for me. Um, so one of the things um, that I found that could be called an advantage is that it is the disadvantage, and that is when the students can go and look at the objects themselves, they tend to favor them when they put together the exhibition. Um, so when we were putting together the fountain exhibition, you know, we sent students to New York. We didn't send them to Paris, but we sent them to New York and we sent them to Detroit and we sent them to Chicago. So we sent them to places where their objects were and they looked at them and they had some access, you know, cases were opened for them in some cases and, and you know, they, could, they could look at things and touch things. Um, if you cannot do that, your local objects suddenly become on par with others. And in a way, it does open your minds. I've noticed that you are no longer structuring everything around the stuff that you've seen, you know it's right here, but you can really uh, make a more balanced assessment. Um, for undergraduates, what I found, um, is the difficulty of getting to sources uh, about your exhibitions. And I'm actually looking at the comments by Tom Dale, which is a fantastic comment. I'll have somebody else read it. Um, but, you know, with a suggestion of how you engage using QR codes, how you engage uh, with the deeper analysis uh, of the bibliography and of the objects themselves. Um, for my undergraduates, when they don't have actual access to physical books and physical catalogs. This is 
a chance to teach them about the legitimacy of sources that they find mm -hmm. online and how to judge it, even if you will never, you know, get your hands on that source. If you wish to include it for further reading, how do you know it's kosher or not? So that, that would be my input. Great, thanks. Yeah, so I, I will read Tom, Tom Dale's comment uh, out because it's a comment on exhibition labels. He says, uh, I have co-curated a couple of exhibitions with my students in which we had QR codes on the object la labels. We were able to give the viewers access to on the online catalog information with deeper analysis and bibliography as they moved around the exhibitions and further could assess what attracted the viewers, how long they spent reading the material for each object. Um, I'm, I'm going to infer from the comment, but I don't actually know what is a QR code. Oh, it's the little. Um, oh, the, 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 oh, right. The little thing you snap with your phone, and it. I wasn't digital. I didn't know. I just call it that thing you put your phone at. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 CMA has the art lens that allows you, right. you know, point your phone or your iPad, and then you get a lot more, which uh, I haven't done, but my colleagues I know have done. They design the exhibitions specifically um, in, around the art lens app. Um, excuse me, could I ask Alina a question? Uh, I, I was actually intrigued. Uh, have you considered or ever used um, project management software? Because putting on an exhibit is, is such a complex thing that spans tasks and roles and uh, set dates that vary with time. Is that anything you've, you've looked into? Not yet. Um, this really up to now has been much, so no, not yet. But this is something that I am looking at and I'd love to hear more if you have mm -hmm. ideas. And you have ideas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just like the idea of this sort of the timeline to show, you know, when is the production of the catalog? When is the final proofing of the catalog? When do the flyers have to go out? When are the speakers notified? You know, when is the exhibition taken down? Th those kinds of, you know, complex timelines are, are just perfect for project management software. We've done it the old fashioned way where, you know, I give them the timeline <laughs> and then they adhere or they come up with it after doing some research, but thank you. Okay. Well, we only have a few more minutes, a few minutes left, and I know some folks have, have already exited, but just I want to open it up to various presenters if there are comments you, or questions you guys have for each other. Thank you, Sean, for, for leading the way. Yeah, Pamela. I, I was going to tag on to the question about copyright because Sean gave a wonderful answer. Um, <laughs> but I, I, there, there are additional things to think about with images, and, and most of that is that any work of art that you're looking at in, in the Middle Ages is in the public domain. So the work of art is not a concern. Um, the image of the work of art is somebody's image. Someone has taken that photograph. And so there are situations in which a person might say, no, I control that because I, I have taken that photograph. You know, Most of the time, fair use covers our use of works of art, of images of works of art. You know, Nobody is going to tell you that Chartres is under copyright. It's, it's, it's a public domain object. Somebody's photo of, of Chartres is controlled. But if you're using it within a classroom context, um, American fair use doctrine, U.S. fair use doctrine protects that. Outside of the U.S., I think it's often different, but um, within a classroom, if you're teaching in the U.S., I'm not sure how it is in Canada, there's, there's really no limitation to worry about. Great. Yeah, that, that's really helpful to, to think about. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I think sometimes when students are in the know, they do have those concerns, but yeah, our mm -hmm. classroom space, thank goodness, is still... And it's good to think about it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Oh, any any other questions I may be missing? Comment. If not, um, we are. So I had a really oh, quick sorry, comment oh, okay. for Alina. Um, yes. I guess just a comment and, and a question about whether um, you you highlight this for your students and for others. Um, you know, it, uh, I think that um, we're now moving into a new world where. Um, uh, we're moving away from just the article or the monograph as an expression of intellectual work. Mm -hmm. And I certainly think that planning an exhibit and having an argument <laughs> of what your exhibit is and what you're trying to prove um, is, you know, a different kind of intellectual work. And I'm just wondering um, if you talk to your students about, um, you know, how they get credit for that or, or if they think about it in those terms or if other people um, can think about it 
in those terms as a as a viable means of intellectual work. So they what they create is understood as their intellectual property. Um, I tell them that nobody can copyright ideas, and that is sadly true. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, what uh, in the past I we always suggested my colleagues and I is that they can then use um, their exhibition pitch and pitch them to actual museums. So in the case of this CMA, because we have the joint program, the relationship already exists, we have put on shows that were proposed and designed and curated solely by our graduate students. So this is different from um, you know, what Stephen and I did for the Table Fountain, where it was really our brainchild and students participated with all the assignments. But it is something that students can do from scratch. They get full credit. Um, if the brochure comes about, they never got a catalog out of it, but if the brochure or gallery guide comes about, it's copyrighted, it's under their name. Um, it's their publication um, and it's always marketed and publicized as their work. Great, thank you. I just uh, like us to think differently about what we're producing well, these days. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, thank you, Laura. And I think that you know, is a question and comment that um, ties up uh, all the work that we've done in these two workshops really nicely. And that I think um, we can see with all of these tools and different innovations in terms of pedagogy and the communication of ideas, as well as an assessment, um, that the way we're thinking and working as teachers and scholars is, is shifting um, in really exciting and profound ways. And just as a, a way to kind of wrap up, I do want to come back to, to Andy's comment in the beginning about um, um, well, I'm probably paraphrasing, I'm not sure he used exactly this term, but <laughs> about taking um, risks in the way in which we are teaching uh, and to teach um, collaboratively, which has really come out of many of these different uh, presentations to, you know, this is really a moment where whether we like it or not, we're put on the same footing as our students and we need to be open and honest about what we do and don't know, <laughs> show all of that, which I think in many, many, many ways pays many dividends. But, um, you know, we've, we've seen kind of, kind of how that works, that we all are in this moment collaborative learners, uh, albeit about different things and different ideas. Um, so I, I um, just will wrap up and, and say I, I leave these webinars hugely inspired um, and curious <laughs> about what to, will come next. I also want to take time and just thank uh, each of our presenters um, heartily and um, uh, heart, in a heartfelt way, thank you for, for these presentations and for all the time that went into this behind uh, the polished uh, PowerPoints and handouts and assignments, etc. cetera, um, because I, I know this was a lot of time and energy in the middle of a, a very unusual summer. Um, and again, all of this information, these presentations will be available on the Middle Ages for Educators website uh, as dedicated tool talks with separate pages. Um, and just to remind Mind folks that all of this will be also up on the MAA YouTube website so you can watch the full um, webinar again uh, in a couple of days once Chris does his magic and uh, uploads it. Um, I also want to in particular thank Laura Moriale who um, was so instrumental um, in, in reaching out to so many people that she knows through the digital humanity uh, world uh, and uh, really uh, was key to pulling this whole thing together so, so thank you Laura. Um, and, and thank you, Lisa and the MAA for letting us do this. Lisa, I know you had a few concluding remarks too. Yeah, I just want to add my thanks to our panelists, both for this session and the one last week. Uh, and then especially, of course, to Anne and Laura for your leadership and taking the initiative to put these together. I think it has really been extremely useful and eye-opening for all of us, um, especially those of us who are going to have to be teaching online in the fall. This has been really uh, an extraordinary series of webinars. Um, those of you who are, are here, if you are not a member of the Medieval Academy, please visit our website, explore it, get learn who we are and what we do, and I hope you'll consider joining us uh, in our worldwide community of 3,500 medievalists. Um, and follow us on Twitter, and uh, we will have more webinars coming up uh, in the coming months. I think this has been a really a uh, useful way, um, not only to keep our community together, but also to 
uh, really engage and think about the issues of the day um, uh, uh, for, um, for the benefit of all of us. And uh, on that note, I will uh, bid you all farewell. And I hope we will be able to greet each other in person. God knows when, but hopefully soon. I wish you all health and wellness. Uh, and I hope that we will see you again soon. Thanks very much.